Welcome to the Thinking Tackle podcast. Now, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And today, we're joined in the studio by Alex West. And Alex is one of the most technically gifted and driven anglers of his generation, and he's caught some of the finest carp the UK has ever produced. Alex, thank you very much for coming in, mate. And I, I'm saying that particularly because I feel quite privileged that we've got you in at the end of what has been a, a pretty... Um, memorable spell of angling for you, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks very much for having me, Rich. Um, uh, well, don't feel privileged. I'm just another guy, mate. Um, but yeah. No, no but you're a guy who's had a hell of a uh, six weeks, I would say. Yeah, the, the summer's been amazing. Yeah. Um, it's gone really well. Gone to plan, I suppose, you know. Mm. Um, fished really hard. Fortunately, I had a bit of time off and uh, things have come together, you know. So often, you, even when you're doing a lot of time on these hard lakes um it, it just mm. it doesn't go how you want it to go something gets in the way or whatnot and yeah fortunately it's been great no and i think that's something we're gonna we're gonna pick up on for sure is this idea that the lakes you're fishing it's not just you against the fish no. and actually we're going to talk a lot about fishing pressured lakes that's yeah. kind of one of the things i really wanted to, to dig deep into with you but um let's just put a little bit of flesh on the bones as to the campaigns that you have just not drawing a line under, but certainly, you know, you're a step closer on Dinton. Yeah. Because you caught what a lot of people believe is, you know, one of the very best mirrors in the country, Son of Triple Row. Yeah. How did that feel, mate, after um, so long? Uh, there's been some very, very special moments in, in my fishing life. Um, and each fish after the campaign you've, you know, you've endeavoured into, yep. um, has, has got its different unique mm -hmm. buzz um but but yeah I, I suffice to say it was quite emotional you know really uh yeah in a few different ways you know um it kind of drew a line under uh, and you say a step closer for me I, I could i guess in a way um happily walk away from fishing that lake love the love the lake uh the fish are incredible um but yeah, the, the pressure of the anglers and all the rest of it, um, and it's the, the atmosphere at times isn't always as desirable as what you'd mm, want mm -hmm. in your, your carp fishing, which is, after all, uh, an escapist pastime, you know? It is, but it's also, it seems to me over the years, you have put yourself on the very busiest lakes at times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess um, it, I guess there's no uh, coincidence that, that, that some of the very best looking and some of the most desirable carp in those lakes that they that, that's where they reside so mm. if you want to catch those fish you have to kind of rub shoulders unfortunately it's just it's nature of the beast mm. um, and then we've got a picture up oh, of um of some triple row i mean this is an epic fish isn't it yeah i mean that's toby you appreciate nice that video. don't you yeah what's that yeah um talk to me about the character of that fish alex and and how you um how you planned to trap it yeah so that that one in particular it's um over over the locks, I've fished the lake for five years. I mean, it's, it's my fifth season this year. Um, so this season, I haven't always fished it flat out. This is the first real season I've properly gone for it. I'd say, um, and uh, that that fish in particular loves a summer capture. It, it seems to seems to go a little bit silly. Not silly. It seems to drop its guard, so to speak, during the months of sort of June, July, and August, um, and you know evidently from the captures leading up over the last five years from other anglers like sort of say marcus clark and uh anglers like that that have uh, targeted that fish um that's the time to, yep. to, to to full bore it you know uh and with the you know uh being in the situation where i wasn't working much mm -hmm. um i had lots of time and i had a, an idea and a bit of a plan in my head to to target that fish um, it does like a particular area on the lake or a particular end of the lake. Uh, we sort of touched on it earlier on mm -hmm. about, um, you know, some fish being more territorial than others um, and frequenting or certainly feeding in certain areas of the lake at, you know, certain times of the year. Uh, and albeit that the swim that I had it in my mind to target was reasonably busy because I had the time to kind of be in that swim or that zone or where I thought it would come from. Um, I had that opportunity to just kind of not bore it out, but I just had it in my mind that that's where it potentially would come from. So I put all my my time into to that that area mm. um, during the close season. Um, well, in fact, I started 
fish in that sort of zone or that sort of area in the spring. I started in about a April. Yep. Um, and uh, it was busy then, you know, it's always busy on the spring. Uh, and I, but at the same time, I was trying to find areas that are lesser fished, um, still in that same zone. Um, caught one or two fish uh, from, I think, uh, uh, one of the swims up from where I actually caught it. Um, but eventually I was getting hemmed in because people were cottoning on to actually where fish were getting seen and caught. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I just ended up fishing in, a, in an area that if I could get in there, it gave me a lot of water to fish with, a uh, lot of spots as well. Um, there was good weed growth uh, through the middle. Um, and yeah, that like I say, that that fish also likes a, a bit of bait, you know, and leading up to that summer, uh, in fact, after they spawned, I, you know, the first, I think, uh, sorry, the last three weeks of the close season, I ended up just smashing loads of bait in, you know, particles boilies um basically whatever i could get my hands on and this was purely to interest a greedy carp like this one yeah so literally um throughout as i say uh, i think when i caught it it hadn't been caught for 11 months so mm. it was like the july beforehand or or something um that it was last caught uh and it always seems to well it always seems to do a rebound capture like it's done this year so what i mean by that is um, whether or not it's just because at that time of year it's going silly or whether it's you know it's it's the shock to the system mm -hmm. and it just carries on munching mm -hmm. I don't know um, but it always seems to do a, a, another capture a couple of weeks after its initial one and always always around the same time um, so yeah literally that that carp is just it seems greedier than others um and yet gets away with it for the best part of the year yeah though. for the rest of the year like you say it's like god knows what it's doing probably eating snails what, or whatever off off the weed you know and did you have eyes on this fish early in the year in yeah. the zones that you were expecting to yeah be? well uh, the thing is um funnily enough i saw it uh last week's show uh at the same end slightly different area of the lake and off the back of that realized that what I had seen showing before around other zones up that top end were that same fish. It does tend to show, it shows in a, in a specific way mm -hmm. or quite a unique way. Um, it almost waves its tail like a little flag, you know, like when it comes out, doesn't sort of bosh out like a lot of carp. Is it body shape, do you think? Yeah, body shape as well. But also, I think there might be, I mean, if look at the shape of it. Um, it's deep think, fish, isn't it? Yeah, but whether or not it has a, a bit of a buoyancy issue i don't mm -hmm. know it's swim bladder um you know some of the lads um, that said they caught it previously or it's been caught previously when it was going back or when it was in the net or in the sling it um it goes on its side uh it actually did that momentarily uh when i was putting it back mm -hmm. after i did the pictures Pretty of it unnerving i guess yeah yeah <laughs> you know you're you know think fingers crossed that yes. you know everything's uh hunky dory with it but yeah ended up um you know but just keeping it right and uh off she waddled sort of after, after obviously put it back but this one shows a bit of the shape alex doesn't it we've got an, we've got a picture here of that's you why with i the wanted fish to put that one because it just yeah. shows how thick that fish is. yeah there. it's a uh, very you know it's sort of almost like a saddle shape you know put a saddle on its back yes. sort of thing short deep body carp and uh but yeah it's it, like you say it's it doesn't seem to slip up um all around the rest of the year and it only seems to be the summer it just goes on a bit but of a wild munch so presumably you've touched on the fact that dinton is busy and mm. also fished by some very competent anglers yeah they must also know what you know yeah so there was uh one or two others that uh and i think miles was um there was miles gibson and uh another guy called robbie um that that were fishing that sort of zone you know concentrating a bit in that zone as well um over time um i think it was me and robbie that ended up uh well we're luckily the ones to to catch it and consistently keep putting the bait in the zones that we were fishing um and i think that was you know once once that was happening some of the other anglers um were leaving us alone i i, I think uh the swim i picked wasn't as good in that sense because it was a busy swim uh and i'll probably touch on this with the other lakes that we might talk about later but uh, it was on the carp bank, so to speak. So what I mean by that is the bank that gets fished the most um, as such. We had one that we, the anglers that I fished with on the car park lake, there was a carp bank with the bars, you know, the curly and all that. They were the most regularly fished swims. But on the sunny bank, 
um, you know, that that wasn't fished as much. Um, Robbie ended up, uh, he, he baited a, a, an unfished swim on the sunny bank and ended up catching it after I caught it on the rebound capture. Mm. But then he did catch a few more as well, you know, did really well and, you know, picked the right zone to be left alone. He was getting left alone all through the week and then at the weekend, uh, you know, he was doing a couple of nights and bait, he was baiting in the week because he's local, but um, I'm not so local. So I ended up having to kind of do more time for it and uh, just be there as much as I could so that I'd secure the swim. Because every weekend um, there was people fishing in there, obviously with that in mind. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, a, it was almost like a, a race, you know, a race to it sort mm. of thing, you know? And I, I guess the only way I could see that uh, with that swim in that area uh, was just being there and baiting it regularly yeah. as I could. And it's fair to say, we should point out at this point that you have always worked, you know, you've never been a full-time angler. Yeah, yeah. So like all through my career, I've always worked, not always sort of 36, 37 hours a week or whatever, mm. 40 hours or whatever you call classes as full-time. My old job as a PT, you know, I pretty much did that and it was behind the scenes work. So you kind of were working that, that length of time, if not more every week. But yeah, I've always worked sort of four or five days a week mm. in, in the past. Yeah. I just think it's important for context here that we're not talking about someone who fishes habitually four or five days yeah. a week. I mean, like, I wish that would be lovely. Yeah. But but you have had a bit more of an opportunity to do that. Like you said, going full bore, as you put it. Yeah. Um, now, can you take us into the heart of that campaign in the lead up to the the capture? Like what, what went on? Yeah, so... Um, uh, so leading up to the capture, it was, it was, it was quite mad because um, I was I was chopping and changing with a couple of zones out in the middle. Um, why, why was that? Like what, was, what was going through you so, tactically? What were you thinking? What, what I was doing, basically I, I found that it was with obviously leading about and all the rest of it, there was a couple of areas that were pretty much the same clip. But, you know, you, whether you're talking about fishing 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, whatever, even, even around to sort of even... I guess like sort of ten o'clock. There was, there were zones that were that felt similar, um, but uh, and at the same sort of range. So I felt like it was a similar, maybe part of the gully, mm -hmm. uh, silty gully or clay area. Because a lot of Dinton's, there's a lot of clay in Dinton. Um, I guess uh, you know when you see them show um, with the marks on them from the clay, they obviously use them to get para rid of, rid of parasites, mm -hmm. etc. Yep. But they're not always the best spots to put a bait, you know, but it might be nearby that that's a good a good zone. Yep. So anyway, I figured that regardless of what part of that gully I was baiting or fishing, that, you know, it, that fish would be eating my bait. You know, as long as I kept going in that area, I kept consistent, that would, that would be um, a product of its downfall, you know. Um, there was also a zone to the left, uh, short in the swim, which was quite deep and very, very weedy um, that I ended up, sticking a fair bit of bait on and funnily enough the night before um, we've got sort of fast forwarding it a little bit but the night the night before um I, I got the bite um I was getting liners on both rods um and you can I guess you can tell sometimes whether it's a bigger or small fish sometimes you get the few experience you get a few odd bleeps um and then you get a tench or you might get a bream or whatever it is or whatever lake but these liners were quite big up and downs, you know, like the bobbing was going up to the top, back down. Um, and not like I was getting done, like really short and sharp. They were more just sort of steady up and down. It was almost like something big and fat's grabbing around and just knocking the line or the leader. Anyway, so um, yeah, so basically, I, and this sounds a little bit noddy, not I'm afraid to say it, because everything, you know, happens for a reason. And, mm. um, and angling's not always, uh, black and white is it unfortunately you know we always like to think we're going to hit the hit the clip and hit the mark perfectly every time and everything's going to go smoothly you know from people whether they're listening to this or what have you might think that anglers on this show might always have uh perfect fishing sessions but yeah not that not that that ha always happens at all um this was far from it after those liners i was getting on the first night of a, of a two-night trip and it was a very um it was really really hot middle of the summer absolutely boiling hot summer 35 36s um and yeah after this night i'd reeled in my right hand rod after getting some pretty savage liners and it was tangled and i was like great so basically something's been out there anyway uh, and the rig wasn't presented 
probably on the cast. Um, not that I'm using stiff booms or was using stiff booms. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so um, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd gone back uh, the next night thinking, right. Um, so I had to look around the lake. So I go, go back. I had a look around the lake, found some bubbling in another area. Um, actually spoke to a couple of other people. Even my girlfriend said, no, no, just stick with what you're doing. Um, and I thought, do you know what it is? I've got some light. I've had some liners. All I'm going to do is just repeat the process. Um, that night, I put a little bit more bait out on the right hand rod. What are we talking like quantities wise? Uh, so I was because I was using pump particles and spawning is not my forte at all. You know, I, I'm not saying I put it in trees every every cast, but you know, um, it's not. I'm not a you know, I'm not one of these guys that hits it on a dinner plate every every spawn. Um, it's just not something that I've done forever. I've generally boily fished throughout a lot of my fishing, you mm, know, mm. because these days everyone does spawn. So I try and be a little bit different uh, most of the time. But anyway, in this instance, I was putting a lot of bait out. I wanted to put it out, it's probably 15 spawns, something like that. Anyway, um, the next night, um, you know, same thing. But once I put that rod out, you know, I, I wanted to make sure there was a, a quite a small spot. Um, and sorry, I'll rewind the clock a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, why I chose to to fish different areas. So basically, on in in Dinton, when a fish want to be in an area, sometimes they'll stay in there regardless of lines being in there. However, they'll they even though the bait's there, they're gonna you'll see them feeding just off of it, and they do that and they'll dot around and they know exactly where your lines are, like most pressured carp. Um, but and the lead up to this and a couple of weeks up leading up to this, and I started concentrating on a on a on a central. Uh, zone straight in front of me is that I kept seeing uh, a, a patch of bubbles, like one singular patch of bubbles over one spot. Um, and I and I narrowed down that spot basically to this dinner plate I'd already found previously, but I'd not got a bite off yet. It must have been the size of a dustbin lid, but it was just really smooth and clean. Like, And the drop was like different to everything else, you know, it's like a crack rather than a silty, uh, not silty or, 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 a, or a clay kind thud. of thud. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you feel confident when you're getting that as well. But, uh, you know, in my mind, the rig was more presented on this dinner plate spot. The line of where I could see them, fit that single patch of bubbles was on this very single little spot. And uh, I wanted to get that spot that night. And after, I think it was like the eighth cast, you know, and it's not just about the cast. It's how it, you know, it's how it lands, how you see it land, how it go through the air. You want it to be absolutely perfect because... You know, in my mind, if it's not perfect, you've got to redo it. You've got to, it's got to, you got to go again. Um, anyway, it was the eighth cast, put it out. And then that night, four in the morning, whatever, I think it was just, it was getting light. Um, or maybe a little bit later than I can't remember. But, um, yeah, I've had a, I've had a twitchy take. Um, and, uh, yeah, obviously rushed forward to the rod, seen the rod tip nodding, bobbins right to the top, lifted into it, fish on, you know, um, playing it in. Um, got it all the way in, you know, I was uh, at the time and I'd said to a few of the other lads, cause it was really, really weedy. I'd found success where the lead was coming off. I was using a bit of side strain just to keep them up in the water. Mm, seemed mm. like the right thing to do. On this instance, I was using a five ounce lead and I changed to a, a, a lead clip. Um, just because I felt it had kind of more, um, well improved, uh, sort of anti eject properties or, you know, in more instant yes. hooking properties yep, yep. than a helicopter. So stuck that out, had had this twitchy bite, but the lead stayed on. Um, and I, I was playing it in with side strain and it was really, I was really struggling to gain anything on it. So I was like, right, I'll lift the rod up. So I lifted this rod up, um, you know, lifted it up a little bit higher and, and then it was coming slowly. That fish doesn't really fight very hard either. Um, and not that I realized it at the time. Mm. Um, and obviously once, you know, it, it, was, it was getting closer and closer, I could see the telltale you know, rounded lobe of its of it, top of its tail. Um, at that point, you know, the legs started to go a little bit wobbly, and uh, you know, but it's quite a it's quite an incra uh, a crazy kind of atmosphere when you're on your own. You know, uh, you know, in in the in the sort of half light, and I mean, there was there was a guy opposite, funnily enough, um, but he wasn't really he was fishing short, so it wasn't really hindering anything going on on my side of things. You know, you you really do. Things start going through your mind. What fish is it? You know, is it the big and is it the one you're after? Mm. Anyway, um, yeah, see it a few more times and I was pretty much convinced, almost to the point where when it was in the net, 
I didn't want to look in it straight away. I just, I just beautiful wanted, moment. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, then I wanted, to, I wanted to go back. I staked the um, landing it out. Went back to the bank to get the head torch because I didn't want to kind of look in and be like half and half and then have to go back anyway. I thought, right, stake it out, go straight back, get the head torch on. Obviously, met with that fish. Um, was just a huge kind of incredibly happy moment, a ridiculous level of elation and euphoria. And you're just, you're left, you're left in awe, aren't you? You know, mm. you're just, you're blown away. Um, not only that, you know, it's it's kind of like a bit of a sigh of relief that and, and everything you've done was, you know, was the, the right thing to be doing. You know, you, you, you'd achieved exactly what you'd set out to do and mm. it just went how I envisioned it. Are to. those the moments... I know it sounds the obvious thing to say, but are they the moments that you fish for, Alex? Are they, are yeah. They, when I mean, they're in the net? Yeah, obviously, you know, the bite, you get the adrenaline rush from when you get a take, you know, jumping in the water and mm. pulling it away from a snap or whatever you're playing. I love playing fishing as well. I really enjoy that part of it. You know, yep. being connected to your yes. quarry is it's probably one of my favourite ways, well, my second favourite part, obviously, other than realising what you've caught is yeah. what you've been after. But that that is, for me, this... I don't think there's a lot in life that comes close to that kind of that wave. I, I guess the best way to describe it is a wave of emotion mm. or different emotions. Um, and yeah, that's it's, it, it takes a lot of beating for that sort of level of emotion. And, and is it something you always prefer to experience alone, like preferably? Um, uh, parts of it, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a strange. Yeah, now you're getting into a bit of the nitty gritty of uh, the psychology of it, but I don't know why. I don't know why, you know, in terms of how, I guess it's when you're hunting an animal or you're trying to uh, catch something, um, it's you against that animal. Ultimately, it is, you know, they the other anglers who either hinder or help you, et cetera, and you've got to go against them. But ultimately, the quarry is w what you're trying to, um, yep. you, what you're trying to, uh, accomplish is is you against an, an an animal which um has got heightened sense of uh you know um instinct and survival mechanisms it's highly evolved you know and and they're a master of their environment as well so um you know when when that all comes together and you can get that little bait and that you, your presentation that you've meticulously tied up and adjusted and tweaked in that fish's mouth and landed it and the hook hold was it, it was Incredible, you know, they couldn't have asked for a better hook hold as well. Um, and obviously, it got caught not long after I caught it, so you know, it's you're safe on that front that it's not going to kind of pass Absolutely or whatever. The ideal, yeah. Um, so it, it just, it, yeah, for that for that moment, it was it was perfect. You couldn't mm. have said that any better. I could go fishing after that. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was well that was well put. <laughs> well, let's contrast that with other things in life, Alex, because it puts me in mind of something. Um, um, Elliot and I interviewed Rob Gillespie, little mm. Rob um, for topography. Yeah, it's fantastic. That he interview. had he caught, because obviously Rob doesn't fish anymore, so yeah. he's, he's the perfect guy to ask about about the kind of because he now climbs um, he climbs mountains, rock, mountains, yep. or rock faces. Effectively, isn't he? he's yeah, a climber. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said that that you can obviously get you can get a more regular buzz from the rock climb that feeling yeah. of accomplishment every weekend if you want it. Yeah, but he said it doesn't compared to the high of a big car. No, no. Which is nice to hear from someone who's abandoned that no. way. But, you know, there are more attainable highs, aren't there, yeah. out there? And I wondered with your training, whether that, how does that fit in with the kind of your search for fulfillment in yeah, life? Yeah, so I guess um, the training, it, I guess in a, in a, it's almost like a, probably a similar scenario to the rock climbing in, in that, you know, your brain obviously is, is getting... Uh, you get emotions and endorphins and and um, serotonin release from you know all these these different highs and I guess going to the gym isn't just about far from it is is there's so much more to training and uh, in terms of what you'll get out of it mentally and physically mm. um, mentally far more than actually physically um, you know uh, gives you discipline and you know uh, it really does help you. Uh, install routine in you, you know, healthy, healthy routines, whether it be with, with food or just getting into, like even with my fishing now, uh, like we touched on earlier on, um, I, I think, uh, and it, it, whether, whether it does or not, it makes you feel good if you're doing something regularly 
and you feel good from it, you, you're going to keep doing it, aren't you? And, and it's as simple as that with it the is, training. It is, but it's also, it strikes me that carp fishing can be the opposite at times. It can be incredibly destructive yeah. because of what you're having to um, sacrifice. Yeah, I mean... Training can fit in. Yeah. Uh, uh, so to be... To, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even now, sit here and I, I don't really... Ha <laughs> I don't actually have a solid job to go straight into, you know, after this year, um, kind of in between careers. You're not um, going to stick with the personal training. Well, no, it's. I had an injury in my knee um, around the same time I moved. I, I left my my old job, mm -hmm. and um, basically, that those things together kind of. Um, yeah, well, it, it wasn't a good combination. It was an awful combination to to maintain consistency through with clients, and yeah. uh, and then it, some of them dropped off, and then that obviously didn't. Do you, so you have to be physically able to be a PT. Do you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Obviously. I think a good PT or a good trainer or someone that, or a good coach is uh, in terms of physical activity, someone that can demonstrate it. A lot of people are visual learners. They're not just kind of, you know, you mm. speak to them. Um, I, I always found that my clients got a lot more out of kind of one-to-ones where I could actually touch them. And obviously mm. the lockdowns and stuff like with that, with that side of things, I was not that I'm a, I don't know if I can say this pervert or whatever, and, and that's the, my motivation for it. I obviously loved helping people at yep. the time and still, you know, enjoy kind of the element of being able to give something I'm getting something satisfying out of in life to somebody else. Yes. Um, and I, my expertise and knowledge or what have you, but... Um, but presumably you can't tell how someone's body articulates unless you're able to just yeah, nudge them in the right direction. Exactly effectively. that. And I, I think that's that was my client, like I was saying before, my clients got a lot more out of that than, than they did a Zoom so session. So lockdowns are tough. So, I, would, I would always find when training with a trainer as well, like I would do my set and then if I'm having a rest, they would jump in and do a set as well. Yeah. So it was almost so added motivation, isn't it? Yeah, motivation, yeah. almost a little bit of competition. Not that I'm ever yeah. going to squat as much as you, Alex. No, but. I, my, my, <laughs> I've had a knee, we're well, not really, I was going to say knee replacements, well, <laughs> quite as bad as that. Uh, I had a meniscus tear and it's been sewn up oh, and it's Christ. still not perfect yet, but so that's what put me out. Um, Understandably so. so that's a won't be squatting at the moment. No, no. Not that much anyway. And this but, is why you found yourself with the ability to at least um, go full ball. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly um, that. Talk to me a little bit, little bit about um, about the setup because I, I've, you know, I remember we we worked together probably like fifteen years ago on the, the magazine era. Yeah. And, and one thing that always stuck with me was how fastidious you are when it comes to your the last few feet and line lay yeah. but, but particularly yeah. like I never saw anybody, for instance, twisting the brass loop on a lead to make sure it sat flush with the lead uh, the lead yeah. that could sit on the bottom it's the first time i'd ever seen that and right and the way that you wrapped your hair around the hook and stuff to right. break up the outline yeah so i got all i definitely can't claim the wrapped the hair bit uh, no 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 but it was the first time i'd seen yeah. it and i saw a lot of anglers for, you so know, um yeah I, I mean i don't know if it, it's this would mold onto going onto the car pot lake but some of those things obviously we're talking about a capture now which is i guess you know the, the lake's pressure now are I guess in a way, are, are no more the tactics are no more advanced than what I was doing when I was fishing in the car park. No, right? um, and even back then, I guess um, with the mind of wanting to be different and to, um, you know, you, in terms of being in a race, get ahead of the crowds or your competition, which are obviously the anglers, you have to think about things that are outside the box and are slightly different tweaks. Even thing, even a millimeter of difference in terms of your length of hair, and they, in terms of your setup, in terms of the, the last, you know, six inches or feet or foot or what you're doing, those tiny little tweaks make a huge difference. And you probably found it yourself in your own angling when, you know, say for a, a wafter presentation, you're, you're, I mean, in terms of the, this capture, I made sure that I had a little because I was using a, a swivel and a slip D, so I'd made sure that. Uh, the 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 balance wafter was uh, was in fact it wasn't balanced. I'd weighted it down, you mm -hmm. know, strangely enough, because the um, I wanted to use something that was harder than the, the actual hook baits, uh, harder than the out of the bait bags. But I wanted to make sure that the the end of the the uh, the tiny little swivel was uh, there was a bit of length to it. It wasn't tight to the back of the hook. Yep. And I just found that extra little bit of distance off the back of the hook gave me better hook holds. You mm -hmm. know, for example. So it's little tiny things like that and the brass loop. Um, do you still do that? Still twist the loop on it? I don't because they've done... They do the heli, the heli they do the heli-led You've yeah. got a nice, you got a, a nice uh, 
ring that comes. So that will now sit. So yeah. now it sits pretty much the you, same as it was before. Are you before. the sort of guy that obsesses about, because you, you say these are tweaks, and quite often you're working in a vacuum, like you don't have captures to necessarily prove all these things. Are you in yeah. your head a lot of the time with this? So, yeah, I mean, it's trial and error, I guess, as well. Um, but, however, you're, I mean, I'm, I, I've always advocated in most of my fishing, unless you're fishing tight up against snags or tight up against heavy, heavy weed where you have to fish a tight line, I've always fished a pretty slack line. And I normally go on, obviously, visual sightings, whether it's got a bubbling over the area right. or, you know, vortexes or movements over the area if it's shallow enough. Uh, or even the type of liners you're getting, you know, if you're getting vicious liners and, you know, you're, you know, the bobbin's not setting back down, you've probably been done. Mm -hmm. um, so from from those sort of occurrences, it's down to you whether you make changes or not. Okay. Obviously, yeah. you can, it's obviously, I in my eyes, it's always good to stick with what you know. But from there, that from that base, in, from my point of view, my angling, it's uh, it's always been good to, um, or product more productive to then make tweaks off the back of that, um, and um, and we're not just not all the time just being different. Um, sometimes you might go with the flow as such. You know, there might be a bait that's absolutely ripping the lake apart, and if you're if you head in the sand about it, um, well, one of the things I was going to say um, on this kind of pressured lake uh, yeah. podcast is that um, you know you can either. A lot of people say, oh, forget about the other anglers, just do what you're doing, concentrate on you. That's all well and good. But if you don't know what else is going on around you and you don't know what sort of patterns and trends to go against or, you know, to go with, how are you, how are you then supposed to make the right choices in terms of what rigs and baits and mm -hmm. tactics you should be using? So you're, you're saying that that knowledge is important, even if you don't go with that. Yeah. It's awareness of... 100%. So how do you get that knowledge when anglers are jealously guarding what they're doing? They don't, they're not all. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these, and some people would disagree with this. Uh, and, it, you know, if you don't do it, it's, it's up to you. I mean, uh, you know, some anglers keep themselves to themselves and that, I respect that. Um, you know, I'm inquisitive. Uh, I like to know what's going on. Mm. Not that I'm all out. And then this this capture, I can almost pretty much claim that it's 100% my effort. But sometimes you are going to glean some information off other anglers. And you'll, you know, whether it be passing by, you'll see, you know, where, you know, a spot maybe that, that's been fished from a certain area or you'll, you'll see their leads hanging up from a, from, from on their brollies or whatever. You know, if it all, all goes in, it's yeah, all going in. It all goes in, and and uh, on a pressured lake, you if you don't notice these things, and if you don't pay attention to these things, rig wise, I think a lot of the time um, rigs are quite important on pressured lakes, as well as the bait. Dinton's really, it's a really very bait orientated lake. You know, if they don't like a bait, you're going to really, really struggle. You know, um, yeah, my first season um, uh, on there, I, I did. I did really well in the spring using choddies um, uh, over a spread of boilies because I noticed everyone was bombing. You know, everyone was bombing particles. Um, so I just wanted to go against the grain. So you've gone for the classic, do the opposite. Do the opposite, yeah. you know, and do the opposite. Often ringing that change makes a massive difference. Fishing in the light low, uh, the light low lying weed as opposed to kind of trying to spot fish, which is something I'm looking to do maybe over the next couple of weeks. You know, everyone still seems to be doing a similar thing. And maybe that's a change I'll make or, or maybe not. Luckily, this goes out a few weeks. This won't be out for a bit, mate. So you might well have made that change. Maybe, no one maybe. Know. fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. But, but yeah, but the um, in terms of the presentation that for the sun, let's mm. say, would I recognise that rig as the one that perhaps you've been working on since the car park when I think we were, we'd we gone out and worked? Um, no, so, so on the car park late, obviously, I, I was using a lead clip system similar to what I'm using now. Um, just because everyone was using inlines, you know, even that mm. tweak, that because a lot of people off the back of what Daryl Peck and I think a few other good good anglers, like even Darren Miles is using like a, an inline system with a soft braid. It was old classic, you know, um, boily fishing, uh, whether you're casting like Darren Miles was or bait boating it with, you know, three, I remember a fudge, was seeing Fudgy once. So we were all sociable. It was a lot more sociable back then as well. Almost feels like these days in terms of pressured angling. I'm going off a little bit yeah, of a it's tangent. It's fine, you do that. Um, but uh, especially on Dinton, there is a slight toxic element in terms of the animosity you might get if you're catching or not. You know, people, 
and it's because it's so so busy now people don't well, they're not as open they're not as friendly because they're gonna they feel like they're gonna lose if they've got edges they'll lose them but back then it was there wasn't it wasn't quite as that intense in terms of you know or oh, keep it to yourself don't mm -hmm. get me wrong Sutton at home was but that was a bit slightly different but on the car park lake um everyone was using off the back of Daryl's success because he absolutely smashed it because everyone was using bait boats for him he ended up uh, using a soft braid and big boilies, classic, go against the grain. So I just did a similar thing to, to what he'd done. I felt in my head that on there, they're big carp. Um, they like, they're like they going to always eat boilies. They'll always be boily captures. And I looked back at the captures and did lots of reading, you know, and they always were quick caught on boilies. They knew what those round balls were. Mm. They knew they're full of nutrition and, you know, they, they were just greedy for them at times. So... I just thought I'd go down that route, but I'd use a stiffer material, a lead clip system, which was totally different to the inline. You know, in terms of scenario when the carp had to deal with it, picking it up, that was what I was looking to do. You know, just just do something that they weren't quite used to within that period of time. Does that mean that you think that when they're they've got that the scenario with the with the heavy inline and the and the braided link, let's say, and they get that immediate but fairly um, uh, abrupt hit yeah the lead clip wasn't providing that same abruptness it, it had that bit of flexibility yeah, so that's that movement you know whether it's the enough movement for you know if once once the bait's in the mouth whether they're moving off with it if that's giving the rig a little bit more time okay. to turn yeah where you know look you know i don't always think it's um so obviously with with these with carp I, it's generally uh you get scenarios from underwater footage that obviously has been about mm -hmm. it seems like they either pick it up move off or they'll pick it up and try and get rid of it you know and i found that both of those scenarios the lead clip compared to the inline system whether or not it's more or less instant so it gives it more the hook more time to turn yep or whether it's just because it's a different scenario for them to deal with that they're not used to which is probably more likely that's that's what I wanted to achieve, you know. I wanted something slightly different to what they were adapting. To. And were you losing the lead on the on the sort of the first jolt or? So back then, um, you were, in fact, you were you were using little tiny bits of silicon. Yeah, at the I back was. Of yeah, the... so I was cutting the rub the rubbers right down. So there was like a small bit of rubber, and ideally it would be on the bite. So that the, the once they'd lifted into that lead, mm -hmm. and back then I wasn't I wasn't sharpening hooks, you know. Back then, for some reason, From memory, hooks, it was the old Gamma Katsus you really liked. Well, didn't I love the Gamma yeah. Katsus, but yeah. also I started on with the barbel hooks in a size seven. Yeah. Quite small, you know, quite fine down tackle for those sort of size fish, you know, just slightly bigger than a size eight, smaller mm. than a size six. But they, they seem to work um, anyway for that first season. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a straight point hook um, that I was using. And uh, also, as well, people. I'd noticed, I know, whether right or wrong, I shouldn't be looking over people's shoulders or whatever, but it's something I picked up on. Everyone was using a beak point. So even that tweak, just something that I, in my head, was different. Yeah, it was obviously you had the legacy of Daryl's wide gate use yeah. and also the lads, they were using those Camasan river hooks, weren't they? Or the, the kind of what became the yeah, D7 type pattern. The B975. Some, something. something like that, 775, yeah. yeah that's um, it. That might be the shrimp hook. I, could, I don't know, but anyway, that was the culture, wasn't it? The braided hook link, yeah. The beaked hook, and and probably like a boilie, um, exactly, yeah. or not. Uh, but do you think then that those old car park fish, which had seen it all by that stage, mm. uh, they were able to cope with that inline setup? Would were they using the lead to get rid of the rig? Uh, to be honest with you, um, I, I can't claim because I didn't catch any fish out of the edge where I was watching them deal with rigs. I can't say that, oh, you know, that, that's that's what's happening with that system, mm -hmm. that, that lead system and that rig. In my head, obviously, I just, I wanted just to do something that wasn't wasn't the same as what they've been coming up against. And, uh, and whether or not it's less effective, the fact that it's different, it's something that they're not adapted to makes it more effective, you know, mm -hmm. um, in my mind. And uh, catching that first, that first one, um, which was a dustbin, uh, luckily Incredible enough. Carp. Yeah, yeah, iconic, you know. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, even though it was not the biggest carp in, in the lake uh, because of its little fins and the rounded tail and 
uh, you know, that, that iconic shot with Tell back in the day, you know, with the cardigan, yeah. except not like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's no coincidence. You know. um, it's a coincidence I'm wearing a cardigan. Yeah. But um, but no, um, so yeah, uh, th because of those uh, things, it was one of uh, people's favourite carp, you know. It was a, it was a much-loved carp and a character. And from that, that session, on, and which was, I think, quite a short into the campaign, um, I just obviously carried on with what I'd already caught on. So, um, and was that stuff that you'd presumed would work? You taking it onto the car park, thinking this is what I need to be doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess, um, I guess, it, rightly or wrong, wrongly, um, without observations, sort of from the underwater footage or from seeing them in the edge. And don't get me wrong, since. Um, Doing fish like fishing a lot more fishing since 2007 when I finished in the car park, I obviously learned that, funnily enough, those some of those tweaks that I was doing actually did work. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, it was just in my head that uh, some of those things would work for whatever reason. And so, so we had the lead clip side of things. Yeah. Talk us through the um, how that then worked in conjunction with what you were doing at the rig end, at the actual hook end. Yeah. So, um, uh, funnily enough, like my my set, my, what I was doing from lead to hook, it's completely changed from when I first started to when I finished on the car. Oh, park. really? So talk us through what that transition actually looked like then, mate. Uh, so in the first season, I was casting um, all the time um, and uh, did okay. You know, I had a few fish, um, including Arthur, which was a tricky one to catch. Mate, I mean... Um, spawned, be it spawned out. Um, it's and, in the album though, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I've got, I've got two yep. sets of photos of it, fortunately enough. Um, lovely, lovely. One carp. of the tricky ones, though, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, still to this day, as I say, I, I didn't do a lot of observa observation. Of mm -hmm. Like Bruce Corner sort of thing, he wasn't. Yeah, so Ben, you know, Ben Hamilton, for example, would be a classic person to, you know, talk to yeah. about the observations in the edge because a lot of his angling was uh, of that orientation. But no, in terms of um, you know, first season, I was using a, a stiffer rig uh, because of what had gone before, being supple, and also I was cast inside. I didn't want it to Would tangle. Would that have been the clear amnesia? No, no, I was um, I was using a uh, funnily enough. Um, although I do use the cam stiff, the thinking Angus mm -hmm. cam stiff now for most of my pretty much all of my uh, you know braided rigs or, or slip D's or anything I'm doing with with a with a coated braid. Uh, back then, I was using uh, the very first quarter um, hybrid uh, stiff hybrid. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, just because it was a nice, clear, gravelly colour, you know, mm -hmm. it almost had like a fluorocarbon coating on it, yeah, really did. stiff. And do you, wait, does it lead therefore that you were you were targeting the gravel spots? Were you one of the guys that was, it was not necessarily looking to establish a spot, but but going yeah, where the fish I mean, were used to finding bait? Yeah, that's the thing. Like so, uh, going again with going with the trends. Yeah, be it that um, on the car park, very weedy. I found a lot of the time it was just about trying to outwit them. On you know, on not on your terms, but just on, on their, their dinner terms, tables, on their little dinner tables. You know, it's like here, there. You know, there's a little, there's a pen lid there, and you know, I'm no doubt they'd notice that on, in the spot. You know, and yeah. things like that. Um, but at the same time, if that's the case, you might want to fish it slightly to the left or right. And funnily enough, when I caught Arthur, I noticed that when people were fishing uh, the bars, for example, they'd always fish the right hand edge of this spot, and I mean, I can, you know, Simon Davey was on there when he, he was fishing it. I remember him and Ben Hamilton, they probably worked out half and white come from there. I didn't, I was just fishing. Um, you know, I, I didn't know, I wasn't at that stage in, the, in my fishing on there. It's first season. I didn't know enough about it to know that though, that carp frequented that zone. So I was kind of fishing for bites and I'd seen bubbling and feeding activity on that spot leading up to when I caught it. But um, so what I did is I ended up, putting a marker out straight in the middle of the swim uh, or the spot and fishing slot on the left-hand side of the spot. And funnily enough, the, the left-hand side of the spot was really glassy. And I don't know why, you know, when I watched other anglers cast to this zone, because, and the reason why we'd fish their dinner plates on their terms is because there wasn't that many spots to present, you know, unless you're chod nostering or chod fishing on the weed or, like you say, doing something or raking somewhere totally different, you're, you're fishing on, you're fishing in their little house, their little home, you know, and you're you're trying to outwit them on in their little, their bits that they are more than familiar with. 
So everything had to be spot on, and you, you know, you trying to trying to just fish it slightly differently to some to what was what was happening seemed to to yeah produce a, you know a few bites. Luckily enough, and and how do you assess when you turned up there? how to bait a spot like that which is seeing food every day were you um, going washed out was it was yeah it? funnily enough i was uh and it's been done for years and years and i still do it to this day not in the same way um i'd got a new bait um that i don't think many people were using at the time and regardless of it ever being used in the lake i think it was a, a variation that had been used in the lake already but um I, I wanted to I wanted to use something um, that was that was different, but also I wanted to wash it out just so it, it being a forty eight hour rule, I wanted to make sure that it, it seemed like it'd been there longer, you know, to give me a little bit of a head start. Obviously, limited time in terms of how long you could do forty eight on, forty eight off. So I had to, I had to, in my mind, give myself as many little edges to combat that kind of time limitation, and. Um, yeah, washing out the bait seemed to be one of the things. Is that, that in lake water? Yeah, that yeah. was literally, I'd, I'd collect it from this, this session or, or before the session. Um, I'd either freeze it if I wanted it to be fresh. Uh, I, generally, I would freeze it, you know. Freeze the lake water. Yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds a bit silly, um, but I'd freeze the lake water. Because it could turn, yeah. the, the organic content could have of turned rancid. Yeah, I mean, you only have to look in, you know, if you've got a, an upturned flower pot or whatever, or, or a, a flower pot yes. that can fill up with water doesn't take long for that rainwater once it's been to in there stagnant. to go stagnant and, mm -hmm. and obviously the composition of it to change. You don't want that to happen to your bait. You know, you want your bait to be fresh, but at the same time washed out. Although it sounds no, know, it's, yeah. a bit of a, um, doesn't sound exactly consistent, but um, but yeah, that, that, so that's what I wanted to achieve in, in that sense. Um, and I felt it, it, you know, it would it would help. And uh, well, from that dustbin capture, it, it certainly seemed to be, the case in that first season and what about hook bait so were you fishing the same sort of thing straight on the out the bag literally i was chopping down the sides when i was fishing on the bottom um and uh which i stopped doing actually when i caught heather in the margins and going back to the the rig and the, the 360 in terms of the rig mentality um i started as i say with the barbel hooks stiff links and uh, a lead clip and then it ended up using a running lead uh running lead rig um and I used it in the margins, uh, something that most people wouldn't, you know. And it was quite a, funnily enough, it was it was quite a, not ungainly, but it was it's a bit of a tangly contraption, you know. It was uh, it was not something you you, you willfully cast at a hundred no. yards, you know. Uh, the the lead, lead would probably end up flying off because it was one of these ones with a with a little break off clip at the end. Um, I think it was one of those old enterprise kind of like C clip uh, type thing. A little bit, yeah. but it had like a little stem on it. Okay. I moulded a bit of putty on the stem to always, weight it you've down. You've always been a bit Heath know. Robinson. You've always you have often adapted tackle, haven't you? To to yeah. suit like the yeah. you cut it about or pinned it or whatever it might <laughs> be. Yeah. yeah. So I I don't you know I, I think it's almost like a Frank Sinatra situation. You <laughs> you want to do it your way in your own head, whether you've seen it in an observation type thing or whether you just that's you just want it more like that and uh when i actually ended up catching uh heather out the back bay it was it was uh, i didn't have to trim off the sides i didn't really want to trim the sides off the bait i just wanted the bait out of the bag looking exactly the same as the free offerings whether or not that made a difference or not i never know you know i could have caught it on shaved hook bait who knows um, do I remember right? You only shaved one side. No, so both. Oh, yeah, oh, that's right. It was flat. Yeah, so yeah, both. Yeah, 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 but I guess in a, uh, at the end of the day, when a, when a carp's going to come, it all depends on the on the bait company, doesn't it? Some of them you can get away with. Um, I think I used to have a separate, and this sounds even more kind of OCD. I used to have a a, a, a bag full of bait that had been washed out for two days before the trip, and then a bag that had been washed out um a bait have been washed out for one day so the one day ones were my hook baits yeah so obviously they're a little bit tougher um and i know it takes a little bit more of extra prep but the, in my head it was it was helping you know it helped and uh ultimately unfortunately enough it did actually culminate in the, in the capture but um but yeah so um and yeah, as I say, I, I ended up making a break in the in the coated braid as well, you know, uh, right in the middle of it, which mm -hmm. I've still now I, I I don't think I've seen that often, you know, um, something that I felt over gravel would just sit a little bit more, you know. I flush. think I can only think of Kev Wilson 
uh, who, an equal, you know, very successful big cart man in his own right, we, was fishing that that elbow in the middle yeah. of the link. Yeah, yeah. And gym, I used yeah. to roll a little bit of putty there, yeah. like you would do any coated grade rig. A little bit of putty in the middle, make sure it sits flat. Um, and was uh, that just in case it laid over a, a little bit yeah, of proud? Yeah, just a small. You know, at the end of the day, no gravel was exactly the same size. So if your rigs line over one bit of gravel that's slightly bigger than the rest, in my mind, it it, it would help that scenario you yeah. know um and uh but yeah it ended up luckily enough culminating in that in that fish talk, talk to us about because i think as as much as i've heard this story i think you did it with mike holly didn't you the head of the story <laughs> i still want you to tell it because it's such an atmospheric um the, the heather. capture the heather capture yeah. yeah because obviously you'd you'd focused on that back bay because you're having to lower in with mm. that rig because it's it's not right for casting yeah. so yeah Funnily enough, that back bay, I'd never really fished it before. Um, and the, the atmosphere of that back bay, especially at that time of year as well. What time of year are we talking? So it was late autumn. and um, Oh, really? What, yeah, late, late yeah, October or end November? End of October. Really? Yeah. So, um, so I, it's funny because uh, yeah, things happen for a reason, don't they? I guess all you know, circles align in their own way somehow. somehow. But um, my very first... Um, sighting of that fish my very first encounter was when i was fishing uh on the pad lake with uh with with steve this was the first kind of part of the alignment perhaps be it or not um uh we both had a fish each had a right jolly up and he ended up sort of getting the uh, you know his feet his feet got molested by a fox he dropped some pizza on his foot or something like that in the middle of the night i think he was using some weird contraption as a bed chair as you do when you're a kid you know silly it was a silly uh it was a, it was a good old good little social trip anyway uh we both had a fish out of the pads lake each and then but the, f the first time we got there we walked around we we, we skipped the draw because obviously as a, as a group of lads you can have a little draw see who's going where we walked around the car park lake and then tom banks has got heather on the bank you know and uh that was the first kind of sighting is that when he sort of le legend has it he was trying to do self-takes with heather <laughs> i don't know i did so the thing is he well what he did was and i've not seen it done before or since um to be fair he had two bank sticks right next to them and there was a sea of mats as, as, as mm. there would be you know loads of anglers in fact i think we actually asked permission to see if we could just stand there and watch you know because we didn't have a ticket mm. uh, but you know you're drawn to it through you know oh, the, it's a legendary car exactly yeah. the, the legendary uh stories and books and articles that have been written about mm. those fish those iconic carp and um so we we walked around to see this going on and he he had these two bank sticks uh exactly the, the right size for i guess his camera and then he had a, a little bit of string at the top and uh i guess he had and he had a tripod with his camera mm -hmm. don't think he was doing i think he got someone to click the button but he pretty much set it up himself it's um, a bit like what you're talking about then when you know what you want from a shot and you're yeah. the only one that's going to got to be happy or otherwise with that yeah. shot i mean yeah. nowadays obviously you've got the dig digital era you've got the flip screens you can show your mates and you know as yeah. soon as you take a shot you're showing your you know and it doesn't take too long you're not really jeopardizing the fish any longer out the bank in fact even less so because um you know you can see what it's you're right getting and yeah. then you can say look tilt the head to me or whatever and i think there, there probably should be a little bit more of that uh you know in in if if people want to see certain things and or not have disappointing pictures you know there's nothing wrong with uh being a, a bit of a director or you know just asking for a few tweaks to happen because some people like angle shots some people like flat on shots anyway he's got this going on he's caught heather he's put it back i think he had another fish during that trip as well incredible session um so that was that you know that was a very start and we had that was the first time i ever set foot on yateley Anyway, end of the 48 hours, we caught a fish each, we walked round again. Um, and then the second walk round, Dave Baldwin ended up catching it. Um, two days later, as I say, about these fish, big fish rebound Rebounded, catchers. Yeah. Uh, and he had it on a nut out fishing from, I think on a nut, um, don't quote me on that, but fishing from Desi's. Mm. Um, opposite end of the lake from the dugout, which is where Tom had caught it. Um, but again, it had probably gone a little bit silly and just had a munch up. Funnily enough, those car park fish being, even being old, um, and the older fish in Dinton, um, strangely enough, and it's, it's of a similarity in that they, they were more, they're more willing to feed uh, on bait during the colder months. That's something I've noticed a comparison between the two. Um, 
not so much now because there's not as many old fish in Dinton anymore. But back when it was, you know, the, the older fish were in there, whether it was less weed growth uh, compared to nowadays, because that obviously affects winter fishing, um, or whether it's just because the, the older fish are more used to the bait, I don't know. Um, but those car park fish, you could catch them right up until, as I say, like, you know, even November, I think Ben caught Arthur out the uh, chair um, right in the edge, but be it a deepish margin. Um, but yeah, anyway, sort of sidetracked a little bit, see that. So I thought maybe that's a sign. Uh, fast forward the clock, you know, another three or four years, I'd got my, my ticket for the car park lake. Um, I'd already uh, joined Sutton in 2003, I think, fished on a little bit there. So I'd had a bit of a flavour for gravel pit fishing, you know, pressured water fishing. Um, I was already kind of tweaking my, my rigs and stuff like that, uh, leading up to fishing on a, on a pressured lake with riggy fish. I was already doing little tweaks already. Um, anyway, so the day I got there, it was like I say, it was, it was October, bit of a dreary day and uh, quite misty if I remember as well. Um, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating this at all. It sounds a bit played up. Um, but yeah, I got, I got there and uh, in fact, I was borrowing my old man's uh, truck because my, I think my, cu my car had packed up or something. But I had to be there, you know, for that maybe that last gasp, have a go for that se uh, last um, part of the season. Um, anyway, so uh, all the all the gears back of the truck. I was I was torn between going in the back bay and the islands, two the, areas. What was colouring your decisions at that time? How, what did you know that was well? Basically, um, the islands was a known zone for that fish, and like with a lot of these. Uh, fish on pressured circuit waters they have a few zones maybe that they're more frequent than others mm -hmm. uh, and that you can c catch them from or they feed in more than others so they're if you're after those carp they're the ones that you're more likely to to concentrate on so the islands had history for that fish um and other uh, some of the other big ones as well um but also um the back bay as well um i'd seen it in there during the summer I've seen it, you know, not all the time, but it, it would, you know, when it was quiet, it would often, uh, you know, people would say, oh, see that, you know, it was in there the other day, uh, but I, I haven't seen it this week. And I remember seeing it once um, in there and I, there's a little ladder at the front, right at the edge of the swim. In fact, that, that car park lake was absolutely made for it. You probably walked around it a few mm. times and, uh, you know, you got little telegraph kind of screwing, um, foot support so you could climb up the trees. It was about six or seven trees that were just built for climbing. Um, and anyway, like I say, it was quite a chilly one. And we just had not first frost, but we just had them first real sort of cold, cold nights, um, even colder than, than now. It's sort of less than five, sort of three or four degrees, you know. Um, and I think the fishing had slowed down. Obviously, the, it wasn't fast and furious on there anyway. It was only I think it's six or seven mirrors at the time I actually caught Heather. Um, but anyway, so I was torn. So I, and I, and it was a bit of a strong southwesterly wind pumping up the lake. Um, in the islands, it was right on the back of the wind. And uh, I first went round there and I got my marker off, off the barra. And uh, literally in the first chuck, I just heard a crack. The marker has ended up no. 20 foot out of 20 yards or whatever in front of the swim i was aiming for a fifth the old steps they called it the step i think the steeple spot or something i don't know something everything had a nickname back then on there you know um and it was a st i was aiming for the step spot anyway um uh so yeah anyway cracked off uh, not cracked off the, the rod actually s exploded you know blank just you know snapped in half pretty much i thought right that's kind of made my mind up. Bang goes the idea of fishing to a marker. Then uh, I don't have one. I don't know the, obviously this was before leading about, leading rods. Obviously I could have, you know, leaded about. However, I just felt that the back bay, <laughs> that kind of influenced my yeah. decision. Anyway, Fate giving you a little nudge. Maybe. Yeah. So anyway, I've barreled round to the back bay, uh, chucked the, the old marker back in the, in the truck because it was useless. Um, Got in there and there was a guy called Listen Here, mate, standing in the swim in his raincoat. He just started to drizzle, I think. And uh, Sorry, mate. Why is he called? I've heard of him, but why is he yeah, called Listen so, Here, mate? Yeah, so as I say, um, God bless him. Re lovely guy, actually. Um, 
a guy called Steve Suizo, uh, good angler as well. You know, again, another guy that advocates who would advocate doing things yeah. differently, s sort of uh, keeps himself to himself anyway. He uh, apparently, I didn't hear this from him. Um, it seemed like a modest, normal guy to me. When he first went on there to a couple of the old stalwarts, it ended up saying that he, you know, oh, listen, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have this, like, you know, I'm going to empty the lake, you know. And so he got the nickname Listen Here, mate. Um, but he didn't come across like that to me anyway. We, we became friends and, you know, you know, shared a bit of information throughout the seasons. He did actually catch Heather, I think. Um, anyway, he was staying in the swim. I've said to him, are you going to go in here? And he said, oh, I'm not sure either here or opposite, because there was, uh, again, another nickname, uh, not made up, uh, swim opposite, tiny little swim um, called Chili's Crack. And I think it's apparently one of the one of the swims that he, he caught. He caught a single out of there, I think, didn't he? Either Maybe. single, yeah. the dust, one of the two, yeah. uh, but he had two out, out um, from that lake, and I think uh, two or three. Uh, but that was named after him anyway. So he was going to go in there. I was like, okay. I said, well, I really fancy going in here because my mark has snapped and I, you know, edge fishing is probably the most effective I'm going to be doing. But I fancy going here. Um, anyway, he was like, oh, all right, okay. Well, I'll go opposite for tonight then. And uh, so obviously it wasn't ideal, you know, we had 48 hours. So I was like, we had an agreement. We're both friends. We said, we'll fish close in. I was only going to fish down the edges as well. Anyway, so I've uh, set up. And as you go into, as you walk through the back bay off of Trumptons, there's, there's a there's a little path, and it's you know obviously this time of year you could smell the damp mm. leaves, so the half decaying uh, damp leaves from the start of the, well, mid autumn, and it had this kind of like little canopy above. Literally, I think the the brolly. I was only fishing a low oval at the time, and uh, you know some of the branches were were just just literally touching the top of the. So almost like you had a you had a, a, a a bivy in a bivy sort of thing in that swim anyway and a little ladder at the front on the right hand side and i'd remembered uh just kind of uh going off the uh, mm. point the reason i picked in there is obviously i'd seen that big in in the summer going in there um when i'd seen it go in there there was a, a a mini back bay and there was a small hump in the middle of that back bay so once it could get into that right in the far corner of that mini back bay it used to go on its side and do like a little kind of almost like a roll but its flank would come out of the water and it, right. would, it would create a bit of a disturbance yeah. like a swoosh swooshing kind of like a rolling sound anyway so i remembered that but, but that's for a little bit later on in this little story so anyway i've gone in there i've put my rods out and it was getting dark by then obviously bear in mind that the light's going around five five half five uh, I waded in, you know, lowered the rigging where I thought, you know, it, and the reason, I, one of the reasons I've gone in there as well is because a lot of the anglers have been putting a lot of their bait in there as they leave, you know, they if they'd gone around the cart, from the cart bank, they'd come around that way, uh, back to the car park, they throw the leftover bait in there. Uh, so it was getting regular bait, you know, and this gravel run down the left-hand side was just, it was just a pure shit, it was just pure gravel. It just, it just looked almost too blatant. Um, but um, and there was a small dinner plate spot just off off the side of this tiny little snag on the entrance to the mini back bay. So I put a rod there, and I put a rod underneath this canopy as far as I dare to kind of you know allow safe fishing because obviously hooking anything in there it was very tight. It's a really you know uh, clost almost claustrophobic feeling swim, but at its own kind of little, especially that sort of time of year. You felt like you were a little cat. You're in a little cave on your own, which was quite a cool part of it, really. Anyway, so we've done the night. Um, mate has gone opposite. I've gone in the back bay, and as I say, the light was going. I'd almost felt like I'd rushed what I was doing a little bit. Were you like having to wind the rig up to the tip of the rod and then sticking it under the tree? And no. So what I was doing, I'd I'd had a I had a baiting spoon and I would just had the top section, and I've always done it this way, really. Like if I'm fishing short. Um, and I can see it because I like to kind of I like to see the rig um, sort of swinging down. Uh, I feel like once the wing, if it's swinging down rather than lowering it down, with any whether it's a stiff link or not, it gives it a bit of a separation from the lead, you know. And that's what I wanted. Uh, anyway, so I've cupped it in, you know. I've I've put some bait around it, and uh, you know that first night it was a little bit rushed. Anyway. 
the next morning woke up biteless. Matey's woken up biteless. We've had a quick chat on the phone, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, I'm thinking of moving. I don't think they're in here, blah, blah. Anyway, he said, I think I've heard fish around the bars. I want to go around there. Anyway, that was a touch and a half. And also, um, I thought to myself, right, um, and I, <laughs> I missed a bit where uh, once I it was light enough to see the spot, I could see all the bait had been cleared out. Right. I'd only put in a couple of handfuls, yeah. you know. I had to stay then. Mm. I knew that that was, you know, just I just had to make things, as I said to you before, about perfect, you know, making things as good as you can possibly get them yourself. I had to get a rig in that I just, in my mind, uh, a rig and set it all up that was, you know, going to snare whatever was clearing me out or uh, doing spot, me over. Alex, are we talking shingle, like clear? Yeah, gravel, like so it was the, the, the top of the ledge, obviously being a gravel pit, the top of the ledge, um, was pure gravel. It's only till I, I stepped down ever so slightly that there was a, it continued as gravel, but there seemed to be like a seam where the gravel was still on top, but it started to soften, you know, like there's obviously a natural seam where the silts have start to build, but, it, and it was, it just happened to, it just so happened to be right underneath this, uh, there was like a, twi a, a like a branch that kind of half snapped and it continued out above the water surface, the first part of the canopy going up to the left. That was where I wanted to put the rig, you know, just, just in that, that soft bit. Uh, and I've, and I wanted something over the top of the fish's head because at least then in my mind, it, it's like they've got a bit of cover, you know, they've got a bit of cover. They, they might feel a bit more secure on that blatant area. Anyway, so the next, the next, uh, the next night I went in with quite confidence, you know, because, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I think I'd look for the sharpest hook I had. You know, I was using at the time those Gamagatsu supers, and it'll be it another straight point hook. Um, I for a no-no in this day and age on gravel, but it's straight out of the pack. And those hooks, are, on a, still to this day, have not found as sharp, as a sharp out of the pack hook as those Gamagatsu supers. They were ridiculous when they first came out. Um, a few other anglers, that I know we were using them at the time anyway with that loop round head. Anyway, so I tied it all up, got it all out. Um, I remember putting up the line a little bit more, you know, I put a few more bits of putty up the line. Um, again, in my own mind, it, I, it was a little bit more out of the way, improved presentation so that if something did enter the area, it was pretty much an undetectable with this little inline rig, uh, not inline, sorry, the little uh, running lead rig with the stem and that bit of putty on the stem so it all sitting flat. And um, yeah, so done exactly the same as I did the night before, but I got it out and I could see everything on the bottom because the light was still with me. And uh, I made sure that the hook was, you know, the lead was... You were using the, the gravel-coated lead yeah, still, yeah? gravel-coated leads, yeah, um, at the time. Uh, I had three and a half ounce lead, not big lead for this day and age, and I'll probably use a five this day and age to just to make sure. Um, but yeah, as I say, I, I had this three and a half ounce flat pair and I could see, I could see that it, um, I pulled it up tight. So it was all, you know, the, the, the running rig was tight up to the, the swivel was tight up to the, um, and then the bead was tight up to the lead stem. And then, and I fished it with a little stopper as well. It's almost like a shocker rig. Um, but I'd, I'd formed it somehow on the lead core so that the bead would eventually slide over the stop. And I've done that with an inline as well, but I won't go into that. Um, anyway, maybe that's for another time, but, um, so anyway, I, I made this shocker rig and, uh, the, I could see the hook, everything I could see. The, I remember one boily just, just dropping down. I was a spoon in a, a few at a time, just, just dinking them around with about two inches apart, you know, a couple of chops as well. And I remember just looking at seeing it, it just, it just dropped down like literally. So I've got the spoon after I've shit the rig out cause I was happy with the rig and I've just kind of wafted it just back out over towards just the other side of the lead, you know, just to make sure. And I was Everything's like, rig end of the... Everything's yeah. rig end, you know, yeah. there's nothing like around the lead or, you know, it's all that side of it. And uh, in my mind, again, because the, the, the safety was from the canopy, a fish would enter the spot from the left. So I wanted it, everything to be left of my rig, you know, just so it encountered the bait first rather than the lead and the, the line and all the rest of it. Anyway, that night, three, three in the morning, I'm fishing, you know, pr locked up, but with a, you know, slack line and that. Um, anyway, so the rod's gone. 
God knows what time it was. I struck into it. As soon as I realised it's got to be a carp, in fact, I pulled into it. The rod hooped right the way round, you know, and I was, you know, it's it's cold. It's, as I say, it's just near first frost sort of time, you know, real clear, clear night. The night before had been wind and rain, you know, wind and you know, real low pressure, lovely conditions. But this this second night that I'd done, it was a really cold night. And I remember sort of I could see my breath. And I, as, I get, as I jumped into the water, as soon as I realised it was a carp, I was straight in the water and I'm sort of full Tesco and I just felt this bang and a judder. And I thought, oh no, it's, uh, your heart's in your mouth. Mm, you sort mm. of, you know, you think it's off. But then, it, of course, it, it carried and it just, obviously, I think what had happened, because it, it did have a, whether it was the lead that did it or not, it had a, a little mark Scuff. on its on its yeah. head. I don't know if it if it kind of, as I, as I pulled into it, rolled and hit that branch mm -hmm. that was above, directly above the spot or whether it was just the lead, I'll never know. But I felt a judder and then the fish, glide, it just glided down the shelf and then almost like, it almost felt like it seemed like it had knocked itself, not knocked itself out, but mm. it stunned. stunned it a little yeah. bit, you know? Anyone that's ever said, or that would ever have said, oh, I've hooked the back, that fish in the back bay, it would go mental, it would go absolutely ballistic, because that was, a, it was a known fighter, that fish, yeah. you know, it was a big carp, you know, I'd see the uh, Gaz Ferran video where he's got it and, the, you know, in the boat and he's powering away, you know, it's absolutely just an animal when you hook it. It wasn't. It literally glided down, glided down the shelf. So I'm playing it and um, I thought it was a small common, you know, I didn't think, it, you know, it was <laughs> what it was, you know. Anyway, didn't really do a hell of a lot and I was really careful with it as well, you know. And all the time, I, you know, you, you, I could feel how chilly the you know it was a chilly sort of dingy atmosphere but I could just in the in the half light see some big ripples coming in you know i was just playing it in anyway got it near the net and i just seen this kind of like pale sort of gray uh reflection got it in the net and at first i didn't I, you know i could see it and i was standing straight upright and it didn't look that big at the bottom of the net but i knew it was a mirror and I obviously turned it over and then saw that little, they call it the strawberry mark on it, you know, um, which was an old healed up saw. And then it was just like, fucking hell. That's it. That's <laughs> fucking it. I've got it. You know what I mean? There it is. Um, so is this the famous side of it? The, the no, of that, that, well, uh, it's not the side of the strawberry mark, but yeah. um, equally as, as impressive. But yeah, it was just uh, a drop to your knees kind of you know yes. uh, how an animal like that can do that to you is i don't know you know it's just i don't know it's a weird it's a weird pastime this isn't it do you know what i mean wait that but was like, what a story that was like that was like it's a little bit long-winded but no no that was wicked i really mm. enjoyed that <laughs> <laughs> well i'm just sort of telling it how it happened to you know in, in my yeah, yeah. In, in the way that I, I can, you know, express mm. it. How old were you when you caught it? Because so, yeah. you, you look young. He's yeah. always been quite baby faced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's rich for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'll still get asked for ID 27. now. No, I don't. Really. <laughs> 27 but, going on 16 yeah. now, right? Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Sort of Pre-puberty, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. but, um, but no, funnily enough, uh, uh, you can't see it on that side, but I did have a love bite on the other side. Did you? Yeah, it's my very first proper girlfriend is that but, where uh, you ducked the chin the other way is that it? no, no. <laughs> but it was just that side wasn't it but as you can see like you know it was um it was full full bloom of autumn there incredible and, thing. Um, talk to us yeah. about the fish mate because because obviously we, half of our listeners were are literally literally listening can't see it yeah. and it's what are we looking at i know well it's a 52 pound um pure pure leather carp mm -hmm. it's um it came from the match late you know his, historically um i don't you don't know i don't know where those fish came from um you know the char characteristics you know real leathery um rounded tail rounded tail leathery flanks you know and um solid uh i don't know if you can tell from the photo but and it was a female fish did fluctuate from from year to year with spawning etc um uh, but you know it's just in fact looking at it in a big shot of it now just uh it really brings back a few memories you know it's sort of um yeah, it's quite you, nice. To visibly see. old carp at this stage as well. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can sort of tell uh, where the colours just starting to dwindle out of out of the flanks. You know, um, 
and you know it's got a few old scuffs and bits and pieces going on but yeah proper old character and an old relic really i imagine um, mega mega history fish yeah you know. i mean look at that that, that uh, sort of accretion of slime by the dorsal there you know is that that's yeah a, um presumably yeah i think yeah by the dorsal i think that's a bit of sunburn actually funny. yeah she was in fact all of them were, were real sun babies you know they loved yeah. the, they they obviously had the canadian for shelter and uh often they they prefer to be just sunning themselves to the point of of um some like say yeah sunburn mm. um and not and just just enjoy it enjoy it and in terms of where you would see them uh, and and they're getting sunburnt could that have any relation to where you could catch those fish um well yeah it did yeah so uh a classic would be um yeah the, okay classic going back to the capture when i caught the dustbin um uh there was a huge so that up the top got the top end for, for the purpose of this so uh on the car park lake you had um obviously brutes corner and then you had a series of swims going down the the works bank um so you had the end work swim which is where i caught the dustbin from now in front of that between that and the uh the bars uh, that were going out towards the bars, um, you had a huge amount of weed because it was a little bit more shallow than the rest of the lake. Uh, and with that, obviously, it was, a, it was an ideal spot that they'd sun themselves. But historically, that wasn't always where you caught them. But sometimes it was, you know, it did get a lot of pressure. But, but you know, the old school anglers, they, you know, they'd be going up by deserts and stuff like that and they'd be fishing the islands because a lot of the time they'd be seen up that end sunning themselves. But as... Right, right, rightly or wrongly called Heather's Table in the Islands. She'd be swimming up there of a night and a morning and classically get caught off of there a few times, you know, which is 30 yard spot just out to the right. Again, near a weed bed, but it would be the opposite end of where she'd probably spend most of her time. Um, I, I, the reason I spent time, more time up by the bars and initially in my first scenes, not that I knew the lake as well as the old school anglers did, where they would like I say be seen one end and go somewhere else to feed I felt I was closest to the fish as much as look if you're closer to the fish and you're on the fish you've got more in my eyes more chance of catching them and that first capture of the dustbin um kind of hit home on that one because obviously it was early in the campaign um it was mid-summer it was like June July uh I'd done about three or four about four or five nights and um I remember setting up and uh, I've got a few photos, really old photos. They're probably no good for the purpose of this, but uh, I've got a few old still photos, the old um, film from the film camera um, of me being right up the, the M Works tree and seeing all of them there, just sunning themselves all day. Whether it's because it's, that's where obviously the cover was, the oxygen, they felt safe. Yeah, you know, shallow water as well. Um, but yeah, so that's where I wanted to fish. And it was funny that that session, the first session uh, in the end works, this guy, uh, one of the lads or a couple of the lads, I think were walking around. I don't know if there were anglers that were fishing there at the time. Um, they might have been um, from the North Lake or what have you, sort of laughing. At, into, oh, said to me, you won't you won't catch a mirror. You know, you won't catch one of the big ones from there, you know. And, um, it's only little commons. And I was oh, OK. And of course, you know, you. you you just fish, you know, when you're young and, and uh, take things with a pinch of salt. I kind of had uh, other ideas, really. There was a lovely spot about 40 yards, 35, 40 yards in front. Because um, back then, and like I am now, um, and I've always been a bit of a, not, less so in my, well, you know, injured days, but with the knee and stuff, I've always been a bit of a tree climber, you know. And back then it was made for it. So I was climbing the trees and, God, what an eye opener it is! I mean, it, it's it's common sense, isn't it? You get above, you're going to see ten times more, a hundred times more than you're ever going to see from the bank. You know of their, their habits, and uh, I, you know, I did it the other day. You know, I was fishing a swim, and I just wanted to work a little bit more out of the, of the swim to see where the weed beds were before I started letting about. So I've got up this tree just to see. You know, you know, I always try and cause as least disturbance as possible if I can. Um, you know, sometimes you end up thrashing it to a foam, but but often I I try and get up the trees so I eliminate some of that anyway. Anyway, so I found this spot, took me a few casts to get it, and uh, again, you know, catapulted boilies around it, and that's what I caught that that first fish on it, and it just go went to show that you know the theory behind oh you you won't catch 
certain fish from from here or there it wasn't right at all you know all the fish are in front of me it just so happened that one of them biggins did actually fancy a snack while he was sunbathing and six o'clock in the morning you know one of their mornings it rattled absolutely ripped off and it was a dustbin on the end and uh yeah it was funny because a season or so later i think uh lee picknell caught heather from that very swim and again it just sort of went to show that it's not always uh you know those older uh, adages from from the past that that ring true it's 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 a bit of a bit of the new thinking and new school that, that can can you know often it often happens on lakes doesn't it you know where where someone rocks up never fished the lake before and, you know they bang out the big and just because they got a fresh head on the shoulders i suppose mm. and, and of course mate it's like having those fish in the album no one's going to take those away from you now and, and they're mostly gone aren't they yeah sadly so yeah nothing lasts forever does it it's probably been said a million times mm. but yeah um especially don't make them like that anymore do they Black no mirror and you know uh mary's mate mary and all those yeah i mean carp. but you you that wasn't the end on the car park not quite was it for you no uh so i, I did go back um in i think it was 08 or 09 or one of the two um because i had a gold card at that time and um throughout the summer i did the odd trip i think i did a, another sort of 12 odd nights um there was one close shave uh that um we touched on a, a minute ago off off um, off the mic sorry <laughs> uh, smashing into that um yeah uh which uh again um from the dugout swim uh, which was one of my favorite swims on there actually um because you could look right up the the other end of the lake um but yeah it was a, it was a um a classic sort of new south when westerly picked up um and as i say i'd, I'd re well re gone back because there was a couple of fish or particularly the big orange that i really wanted to catch um a reason for that I'll, I'll go into in a little while but um yeah as i say it was a fresh southwesterly blowing straight into kind of the inworks and the dugout um and uh yeah a very close shave with the baby orange because i see it show twice on the second morning uh, of my 48 hour trip uh literally uh, within a rod length of, of my spot um and as i said before uh off off camera what have you uh hindsight's a wonderful thing uh ended up uh putting a, a bit of particle out and i'm, I'm sure and, and fishing long on the on the spot i'm sure if i'd fish shorter on the spot like i had done in previous my previous campaign on there uh i think i would have had a better chance it was um the fact that uh I was, there was big sheets of bubbles coming up um that I, I reasoned for some reason that they were in the silt on the back of the bar um, or on, on the feature or the back of the feature, but they weren't in, they were in fact on top of the gravel. And funnily enough, um, you know, that uh, I, don't, I don't think it's always down to the lake bed that produces the bubbles. It's just the feeding activity and all the, um, the bubbles they produce that are going through their gills that, that creates the actual feeding bubbles. It's not necessarily, oh, well, they're in the silt, you know, uh, obviously often they are in the silt when they're fizzing up and, you know, it releases the gas bubbles from the silt. But when they're on top of you know, the car park lake in particular, used to be classic for that. You absolutely sheet up over rock hard gravel when you think, how are they doing that? When it's just, a, a, you know, it's like a billiard table, but, um, you know, it's obviously the, the stuff going through the, 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 the gills mm, and, mm. And, and stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, didn't get the bite, uh, but saw it come out twice to its to the wrist of its tail. And uh, yeah, that was a ch sort of chance guy. I did, I did actually, um, uh, fortunately enough, catch a little stocky, one of the stockies, uh, small linear out the back bay. Um, um, but yeah, that was the that was the only fish I had when I when I went back. Uh, I had a funny. Uh, I was going back to the the occurrence. This was when I originally uh, was was fishing it sort of throughout uh, 06, I think, or might have been 07, um, with the big orange. Quite a what a, well, not a close shave as such, but um, just it was almost it, it showed me just how potentially aware the carp were of, of your presence. And often in that car park lake and in a lot of lakes um with big carp in that have lived in them or resided in the lakes for a long time is that i found that they're fully aware they're getting fished for they don't and they're not that bothered about the disturbance uh, whether it's the weed buffering what you're doing in terms of casting or whatnot or it's just they're just they're, they're used to it so you know it's like on a park lake for example but in this particular occasion this was far from the truth um I was up a tree again between the M works and the dugout and uh 
looking down uh, on on this fish and uh, it, it turned out to be the big orange but the only reason I struggled to identify it because I could only see its head um, in this small window of weed um, you know I could see all my, I could see clearly as, uh, as day you know its eye um, you know looking at me at the time but I could obviously that's how good a view it was obviously crystal clear lake and um yeah, I remember the tree being a little bit on the spindly side and, you know, I've, I've got the branches, one in each hand sort of thing, because uh, I only had one foot, one proper positive foothold and my foot was starting to go to sleep and uh, I thought, well, I've got to adjust at some point anyway. So I've kind of done a bit of a shimmy, you know, holding onto the branches. I was probably 20, 30 foot up the tree. And with that, you know, I've, I've sort of switched and uh, it kind of felt, you know, obviously landed on, on my other foot a little bit heavier than I'd wanted to. And within a few seconds, and no, no word of a lie, it, it sounds ridiculous to say what I'm about to say um, in terms of a carp's awareness or whatever, or whatever it did. But it, it, it literally just sort of ambled out of this weed, window of weed. It did a little circle in front of me going from left in you know, kind of clockwise. And as it sort of got right, it sort of got you know in front of me when I'm up this tree, um it's kind of turned on its side as if to as if to, to look up and say oh who's that <laughs> up that <tree?" laughs> probably not allowed to say that but you know that's that what it felt like within within seconds it's finished its little circle and it's just start, started to pick up pace and it's, it's bow waved up the other end of the lake didn't see it again for you know whatever that trip anyway so it was you know at times they could be very, very cute and very fully aware of their surroundings. And other times they weren't, they didn't give a, you know, didn't really give a shit to be honest, who was around or, you know, um, cause they were used to it, you know, they were used to that pressure. Mm. Which is, you know, what we want to get to really is mm. these, these heightened situations on places like the car park. I mean, that seems like, um, it would have been a really productive learning environment for you. Um, yeah in terms of you you have thrown yourself in at the deep end in that lake yeah yeah um it was funny because swan valley was actually officially the um the first gravel pit i fished and um with similar tactics similar rigs as such as what i was using on the car park but obviously the car park being a lot lower stock you know that the stakes a lot lot higher in terms of you know in that first season there was nine mirrors when i joined um single Uglo, all the others, you know, sort of were the diehards out of the out of the out of the nine. But um, every year from when I joined, uh, with hopefully not a jinx or whatever, but they started to fade, you know. Mm. Um, and obviously, with that, uh, you know, you, you you're that much more, um, you know, it's that much more urgent. You yes. need to try and get it done, or at least sort of do what you're setting out to achieve. Um, but yeah, the learning curve are very, very steep um, in terms of um, watching um, the fish in their, in their kind of not really natural environment, but where they've been placed and then made their home their own and no more so than, you know, uh, than those that, they, again, they just, they were masters of their environment. Uh, I've said it before, um, but, and you know, the senses, if they wanted them to be, as I just, you know, reiterated with that little mm. uh, story about the big orange, they just knew what was going on, you know. They they knew that not that they're getting fished for, but you know they had to be on guard. And I think it's quite it kind of um, sets sets the scene maybe for um, a little story. A little story we might go on to about Sutton in a mm. little while, mm. in terms of um, you know disturbance and just like you're having that hunter mentality in terms of um, your approach and um, how you go around how you, you know, behave around the lake and stuff like that. In a way, that's such an old school mentality, isn't it? You know, lots of those, you know, our forefathers, if you like, in angling terms at least, <clears throat> stealth was key and approach was key. Approaching the lake in a stealthy manner and getting your rigs out and getting your, your baits out without them, you know, twigging you. Yeah, It's become much less about that now because yeah. people are there for longer techniques are more effective you know even just casting a three ounce lead in would seem like anathema to those guys back then but you you were still um keen to make sure that you were as stealthy as possible in the in a 
Uh, yeah, I, th I think I still do things like, you know, for example, my lead in rod, I like I use a, as light a lead as I can get away with to then feel what I want to feel on the lake bed. Uh, you know, I'll, say if I was trying to cast a marker, to, say if I'd done my lead in with a very light lead and I wanted to use a marker to bait up, I'd really, really only want to use that heavier marker rod once. I'd only want to get it, put it out on the spot once. Uh, even when I'm baiting up, I don't really want to, you know, I was baiting up to a marker. A lot of people, you know, they know their clips already, but um, obviously you're fishing in deep water. Um, you know, you know your wraps and clips, but to be extra effective and efficient uh, in terms of hitting the same spot, often I'll still use a marker for baiting up um, just so I know that it's absolutely sp spot on and I'll, I'll clip my marker at the same distance that my fishing rod will, will be clipped up. Uh, you know, fish for the, fish for the same drop with the marker as I do my fishing rod, for example. Um, but you know, stealth and approach in terms of being undetected is paramount, really. Talk to us a little bit about the marker thing, because actually, I was filming recently with um, Gaz Ferrum, and he was uh, putting a marker out, and neither of us had, had seen that done or done that for some time, and there's something deeply satisfying about having that visual reference point. And now I think probably on the car park, the significance of that was because the spots uh, were small and you wanted to be on a particular part of the spot. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. Um, so I kind of just, uh, uh, you know, there seems to be a story beyond uh, a subject, but um, basically I'll just kind of go over that scenario. For example, um, when I was lucky enough to catch Arthur from the bars and I was talking to you about, you know, fishing one side of the spot, mm -hmm. I'd made sure I'd put the marker out in the middle of the spot, but then I wanted to see from three different angles. Uh, so I remember because I wanted to get my, another thing, I wanted to get my rods out before everyone else had got their rods out for the evening as well. Yeah. That's another thing that I kind of, I, I take pleasure in doing if I can do it. Sometimes I prefer to get the, the rigs in before the rest of the, the lake gets disturbed, which can inevitably, oh, especially on a small lake, push the fish back onto you after you've created that disturbance, whatever it might be. Um, but as I say, uh, I'd put this marker out, wanted to fish a particular side of it, and I made sure I viewed where I'd seen the bubbles come in from this spot from a from different kind of reference points, just so I knew I was extra spot on, you know? Mm. Because if you've got those three angles, then you can... Uh, say with a higher degree of accuracy that it was in fact exactly yeah, there. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. I remember um, putting the marker out in the bars, walking around mainly specifically because I'd, I'd, I'd watched all this activity from the dugout um, because that was the swim, I, the nearest swim I could get to from the fish from the, uh, with the fish activity being in that zone. However, obviously when it comes to me fishing in the bars, you know, you don't know exactly how it would look or what the how how the feeding spot yes, or the, yeah. where they're coming from or the bubbles are coming from or whatever it is, in relation to what you've seen from the from the dugout, for example. So, I cast out the marker, ran round to the dugout, you know, made sure to check it, and it, I remember specifically um, this spot was in line with a set of reeds uh, in the curly, and I used to, you know, I'd, as I say, I'd, I'd gone from the from the bars, just checked it was in the middle of the spot run around to the dugout, seen it was in line with the reeds uh, in the curly, then went around to the curly, stood by the reeds. Well, this was as well, this was when there was someone else there. So you're, you're kind of, you're asking people, you know, do you mind if I just quickly look at, you know. As you walked into mate, oh, you yeah, swim in the curly. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I know it sounds a bit, people, some people would say this is ruthless or encroaching or whatever. Um, if you're all mates it, and, and, you know, you get on, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not asking, you know, I'm not sitting there for hours and hours punishing the guy. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's more a case of just making sure that you're accurate. And any, if anything, if there's someone next door, you know, if you're not as accurate and you're not sure and you're casting, 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 it's going to be better for both of you really, isn't it? You know, in mm. the, from that sense. So yeah, you know, three planes of, but that, that was, I don't do that every single time, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, cause you can't always do that. You can't always walk into someone's swim um you know off you know some sometimes people just don't you know that's fair enough you know don't want to talk to you they don't you know and i i don't want to talk to them either so that's fine but you know um 
I, it all depends, I suppose, on the, in the Have situation. Have you had to develop quite a thick skin fishing these lakes? <laughs> uh, it was something that you probably probably should have talked about already. But yeah, I mean, being tenacious, having a thick skin, being a bit ruthless, and it's not. I'm not advocating it at all, you know. But uh, on the same token, um, if you don't have that you're going to struggle you know or you, you, it, it's going to take you longer if you if you don't have that thick skin if you if you don't have the resilience uh, obviously you've got to be um persistent yourself but at the same time you just yeah you've got, you might not always have good sessions and, and stuff and it's just i always think of a new trip especially after a blank you know i always want to learn from the blank and understand why i've blanked understand a little bit about more about what the carp have done during that blank session or from that blank session and always look forward to the next session and always think of the next session when i turn up as a new adventure you know and that's and that's you know i love that part of carp fishing you know even and that i guess i guess it's the one of the reasons why we keep at it you know being mm. persistent and you just sort of uh it, it makes you want it more when you when you don't have it doesn't it so yeah You've been called an overthinker, Alex. Explain why deep thinking is important to your uh, pressured water fishing. Um, well, I guess you know it all depends on the person, your personality. You know, some people um, it, it might not work. You know, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's been times uh, that we, you know, hind, in hindsight, that being a more, you know, uh, thinking of things more laterally or simply um, would would pay off. Um, but for me, like um, thinking about things in the nth degree, uh, bait wise, tackle wise, or rig wise, um, approach wise, um, you know, I guess has led fortunately uh, to some success, you know, and, and um, I guess it all depends on what works for you. And if it, it, overthinking at times helps you produce something that actually you're right about, then, uh, then I, I guess it's all it's okay to mm. overthink, you know. Mm. Mm. It's something you mentioned while we had a short break. Actually, you know, it's more important to be right in the end. But if you're also doing something a bit different, then that's potentially adding something slight, slightly more effective to that situation. You can arrive at being right in several directions, can't you? But yeah. if yours is a little bit different and it's your own, then perhaps it's something the fish haven't seen. Yeah, I guess I guess you can only do. You know, um, you, can, you can only work with what you you've got your you in your in your head and and what you perceive to be right. And uh, as I say, if 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 thinking about things deeply um, does uh, accumulate some success for you, then you, you know. How does that actually manifest for you, though? Are you sitting there in the dark hours on, on the bank? Sounds a bit anorak, Rich. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> potentially. But are you? scrutinizing are you going over in your head what have i how have i performed what have i done is the rig suitable to the spot what are the fish doing like how do you how how granular do you go how deep yeah, do you go i i guess um again it's you can only do your best with with what you've got in your head and and uh to your own your own abilities but i think for me it's it's i mean i you know i don't I think about lots of things in when in, on a dark night but uh yeah least of all carp fishing but um, come on no that's not true alex uh, you definitely think about <laughs> but no so in that context um yeah so uh yeah there's there's going to be times when you're racking your brains you know and uh you're thinking you know how you know what, what you know what tweaks can i make and you know what i've had that lot you know i've had that line of what was that what have I, was have i been done or mm. I think quite often you find these things out over the period of the time where your rods are in. So being super observant on the on the water, you know, like I heard Adam Penning before talk about, um, you Optical know, optical calories. Yeah, opt uh, rod out, uh, viewing rod hours mm. or that, that kind of thing. You know, optical calories, as you say, um, to coin the phrase. Um, and, and I guess part of that, and also, you know, once you're reeled in in the morning, you know, you know, are your hook points still sharp? Um, you know, are you looking it, in detail at that rig for yeah, clues as to what might happen? You might lower it back, lower it back in the edge, and see how, if it's still sitting how you you wanted it to sit when you put it out there. Um, you know, you'll smell the lead to see if you know what the spot, you know, if the spot's rancid or if there's been any, any old bait sitting on there, and that could be that could tell you. Well, I've seen feeding just around the spot, but actually on your spot. Um, and I've seen feeding in the weed, but not actually on the spot. So maybe the fish are there in the weed feeding on naturals, 
and they're not eating the bait because it, the spot's been fished so much or it's too blatant that now your lead smells, you know, things like that. And um, yeah, those, those are the sorts of things I'm looking for and trying to pick up on to try and form that piece of the jigsaw. It's been said millions of times, you know, about forming the puzzle and piecing it all together. And I guess they are, they are elements, essential elements that if you're not thinking about, you're, I, in my, from my uh, personal perspective, I'd be missing a trick if I wasn't thinking about them because, um, yeah, trying to cover as many uh, small percentages as possible mm. is important, you know. Can you be a social angler uh, when you're deep in thought and actually you probably don't want to see people all the time when you're, and you're trying to look at the lake? Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, I, you're going <laughs> to, I'm not a, I'm not a, a kind of like a, a, a lone, a loner hermit type, you know, I do mm. like, um, I do like, appreciate uh, other other people's company when I'm fishing. It's really, really nice to have socials and barbecues and, you know, talk shit and laugh about stupid stuff with your mates and, and stuff like that when you're fishing. It kind of, you know, keeps the, uh, keeps the flame alive, doesn't it? And if that helps you keep going and, you know, stay, stay even longer and keep your enthusiasm even longer, then that can only be a good thing for being mm. on the water more. But you're still able to, st are you looking past people to look at the lake? Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'll tend to, if I'm in a group chatting or whatever, uh, I've caught myself a few times sort of, um, you know, one eye on the lake sort of thing. You know? Angle to the lake at least. You're yeah, not, you're you not back to the lake. <laughs> yeah. What's the point in having your back to the lake and looking yeah. at ferns at the end of the day? It's, uh, you're there to, to mainly to to catch fish and it's lovely to to have a social with people as well and i am a social uh person i like to mm. think i am anyway um it all depends on the lake and the people of course i mean this for some reason and as someone said it's me the other day and, and don't get me wrong throughout this season i have been fortunate on, on dinton to have a uh, have a wonderful time fish wise and and even though i have struggled at times and we've all fucked up as well at times as well like we spoke about earlier mm. but Someone said to me uh, the other day, um, this lake can bring out the worst in people. And he's right, you know, the stakes are very high. The, the fish are absolutely incredible. They're beautiful carp. There's not many lakes with that kind of level of stock around. And that can kind of almost drive a man a bit crazy and distort your personality somewhat. To, to, to You might be a nice guy mm -hmm. in real life, but on the bank, you, you'd have to have a bit of an element of, well, selfishness you know are, are you susceptible to that more oh, so than others or, or, or on a similar level myself personally yes. yeah um i wouldn't say i'm any more ruthless than anyone else some you know some people might laugh at this or if they're watching and 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 say otherwise you know uh, i'll hold my hands up i've you know i've had seasons on that lake obviously i've fished it for five seasons and there's been times where i've treated it as a, an out and out circuit water and even if someone's had something going, when I've not had as much time as I've had this year, this year has been a little bit different in that everything I've done pretty much uh, has been, I've been trying to do it off my own back. So, I, you know, all the, every, all the, all the graft, all the, all the, um, you know, trying to get in the areas that aren't see, receiving the attention um, or, or, li or very little attention has been off my own back or less attention. Mm -hmm. I try to get mm -hmm. my own stuff going, but, there has been times in the past where, of course, you, you're you not going to overlook uh, fish going, fizzing on a spot and, you know, especially later in the season where people start, you know, shuffling around swims like musical chairs. So uh, you can't get back in an area that you were fishing in and, you know, it kind of, you have to do the swings and roundabouts and musical chairs to yep. even get anywhere sometimes. So, yeah. You, Is there a degree on Denton that, that kind of that comes with the territory? Like, you know, everyone should know that. Yeah, I think to a degree, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. If someone's been fishing a spot for the whole season, or if if it's a left alone swim and they're just fishing there, I mean, how many good friends can you have on a lake like that? If everyone's your best mate and you don't tread on anyone's toes, what are you going to do? Fish in a corner for the whole for the whole season? That's that's all you're left to do. Mm -hmm. You know, no one wants to fish in a corner. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You want to be on fish. And, and how long did it take you to come to this state of mind, Alex? Because you know i can't believe that you started out like that let's say or, or you know is it is it are you shaped by what you've seen yeah i think um yeah i think it's fishing a pressured pressured waters pretty much all my life you have to have an element of that of, of don't give a fuck you can't always give a fuck about everyone because you're not you won't be looking out for yourself as well okay we don't go if we ask every single carp angler who do you go carp fishing for 
why do you go carp fishing? Do you go carp fishing so that everyone else can catch? Probably not. If everyone's brutally honest, you go carp fishing to satisfy your own desires, your own needs, and the love of your own love of that of that sport and that hobby. And that, know? and I think one of the things that is often overlooked as well is that investment of time it's effectively you're paying in life aren't you you're paying with your own life to be there well you know you're you're investing a lot of time and if you if you if it's if it extends beyond simply enjoying being at the lake and you want to catch something as part of that then you've got to yeah well I, I'd, I'd say well, forgive me for saying so I'd, if i wouldn't look at it like that it seems a bit of a That's half fine, yeah. half empty way of looking at it like r rather than half full you know um I think it's a privilege to be at these places, you know, like I'm very lucky that I've got to fish some of the lakes that I've, I've fished in my, in, and, and had some success on, you know, fortunately, uh, whether it's been off my own back or when whatever guys, um, I just feel very lucky and very privileged and humble. It's so important, places. mate, that you enjoy the lakes you're fishing. Oh yeah. Otherwise it's, it's a hollow experience, isn't it? Yeah. And if you're just there for the fish, you may blow out in my experience yeah it's uh all the all the lakes um that we talked about so far um you know when you're waking up first light or just off first light um or whenever it is or appreciating the night you know the bats and all the wildlife that goes with them um you know you, you're uh it's um you're seeing what not a lot of people do yeah and and it's it's a beautiful thing to have you know it's a it's a beautiful thing to see and uh I, I'd never, I'd, oh, I'd never think of it as paying with my life at all. I, no, no, I no, I love it. No, but but in in the sense that it's still a big investment. You are still spending a chunk yeah. of your week somewhere. Well, in that sense, obviously, from that point, and of you view, could go camping to Snowdonia, yeah. mate. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you don't go to camp. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you'd have to have rods out when you're over the yeah. mountain. You'd still somewhere. be finding a little pond somewhere. Yeah, yeah you, would. you know. Um, um, Alex, following on from that, I just wanted to ask you, what are you, um, what are you like away from the bank? So, is this buzz and kind of um, Ruthlessness? Does this? Uh, <laughs> you see where coming I'm, across in a really bad No, way. it's 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 not. But I'm intrigued. Does does that follow you home? Like, are you? I don't want to say. No, I'm not. Uh, like, no, uh, I'm not. <laughs> he's racing for a parking <laughs> spot or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's it. Just, just, just <laughs> beefing my horn like right up someone's ass in the fast lane and stuff. Um, maybe maybe uh, maybe obsession is, is a better word. Are you? So if you're away, are you still thinking of these spots? Are you? you oh, I mean. <sighs> I think when you're fishing, well, well I'd call these lakes, we'll call, what I'd call, is, and again, it's this is only my experience and perspective. I call them like the premiership of carp fishing. You know, yeah, the busy yeah, lakes. Yeah. I'm sure there's other lakes out there as well, but, you know, unknown lakes or lesser fish lakes are part of that kind of, they are held with, there's much awe and there's much mm. kind of, uh, you know, they, they epitomize exactly what we go carp fishing for and the, the top of the tree in terms of the fish and the, the, the experience that you get when you're waking up by the lake. Um, but um, sorry, what well, you, you lost the plot you, there. I think I think the point you're going to make is that um, you know these these the lakes that you're fishing are, yeah. are, are what you see as the very very yeah. yeah. When yeah. you're fishing, sorry, sorry. Uh, so the, the the trailer thought I was I was I, was, I lost there. That's a second. Right. <laughs> um, so so yeah. When you're fishing these sorts of lakes, yeah, it doesn't leave your mind. You can't, you know. Uh, plenty of girlfriends in the past that would say you know fucking hell can you just stop talking <laughs> you know can you be off the phone with one of your mates be present, get off your yeah, phone yeah. yeah be present exactly yeah. um yeah I've, I've been in those shoes plenty of times um because when you're in that involved in such involving lakes and such lake lakes that are that have to take up they require so much energy and effort um whether it's your physical, mental, whatever capacity it might be, it's you, you're obsessed by it. If you you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be putting up with the shit from the other anglers uh, if I wasn't so obsessed by the, the lake and the fish, you know. And you kind of have to endure that stuff on these lakes to get the 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 luck, the cherry, you know, which is that is the, you know, is the carp at the end of it, um, and and the experience that the lake gives you, and the, and the lakes that. Uh, even be it the you know, uh, even be it when they're busy and you can see another angler opposite you and stuff like that. Obviously, you don't really want to be doing that. It's not ideal to be waking up to another geese like, you know, <laughs> at you, you know, from the other side of the lake. But uh, they're the moments. They're the re that's the reason why you go through 
the other parts of, of being busy because you know it's um i'm not saying they're few and far between but um yeah you these busy lakes you kind of know you know what's in there you know the, the fish are, uh, are really really lovely and 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 that and it's just part of it i suppose yeah i mean let's let's take a side step to Sutton because you mentioned it a few times it, and many anglers have spoken about just quite how legendary the ability of a Sutton carp to sense the presence of an angler or, or to trip you know to sort of uh, rumble your traps is yeah um so going on about learning curves now fish sutton for yeah um best part on and off for 12 seasons i didn't fish it throughout for 12 seasons but i had a ticket on there for 12 seasons um just purely to keep the ticket i think i maybe missed a couple here and there um but had a ticket from 2003 for to 2009 when i was lucky enough to catch uh the you know the the, the king of the lake so to speak um uh, but yeah so that because i fished it for such a long time and those fish were or did seem to be particularly riggy and what i mean by that is is during your your rod out the times when your rods are in the interaction you get for your bobbins your lines out in the, what you see showing etc cetera, etc cetera, experiences when you're viewing them in the edge um it just seemed like they did have almost like a degree in you know rig dispatching or whatever yeah. you call it you know um the, the funny thing is about sutton um you know it, it's essentially as it was a four and it still is obviously and the fish thank you know thank god you know they, they're still doing really really well uh still pretty much all the stock left in there incredible testament really to i guess um well, i don't know what it, you know the the the, um, the, strain. the strain of the yeah. fish you know uh that old sutton strains so resilient um uh, but but also um you know that there is has been at times some good fishy management on there and there isn't lots and lots of weed they have sorted the bream problem out at times which i think does have a, a massive effect on uh the biological oxygen demand of the, mm -hmm, of, the mm -hmm. of the water body so that's in, in itself you know you know going to improve the longevity of a lot of a lake Absolutely. that's pressured and and tell us that for those who of us who don't you know i've been to something i'm lucky enough to see in those lakes but for those who haven't mm just explain what that what it's like down there yeah so basically it, it's it deepest darkest kent uh it's in the suburbs of kent and um uh as i say four four and a half acre lake i thought it was actually larger but it's it's not but it's triangular shaped it's got a couple of small islands uh kind of two thirds of the way up again you've got like a cart bank um uh, which i i kind of uh loosely kind of tag as uh the, the bank that gets fished the most you know mm -hmm. uh, and on the other side then you've got the twins bank and then and then you've got the, the sunny bank which uh, or the river bank so um yeah so it's it's a it's a rock hard gravel pit so uh, when as soon as you when i say rock hard what i mean by that is is it's it's surrounded by gravel banks all the all the banks are gravel rock hard gravel mm -hmm. um there there is very few weed beds um in Some fact, lilies. hardly any yeah there's a lot of lilies uh lined by lilies um some two major uh sets of snags or there were um there used to be three back in the day when i when i was doing my first couple of proper seasons on there um but they took some of those out but i can go on to that in a little bit um uh but yes as i say so once you you pull up to the gate you've got three gates and uh this is one of the things that i used to try and you know is, is one of those things obviously from reading uh books in the past you know um uh, about how uh the fish could tell when the anglers came onto the lake etc and left and what i normally used to do even if there was a draw of more you know not even if there was a draw if there was a few of us on there in the morning i'd, I'd all pretty much always take it upon myself to open the gates just because then i i, I was it sounds a little bit control freak but i was in control of how quiet uh, the gates were opened as I say there was the, the gate going into the car park and then there was an alley in between so uh, you got another another gate and then another gate going onto the lake and the lake sorry the gate going onto the lake was the one that I was exceptionally you know meticulous and careful about opening because albeit it was a it was a combination it still is I think um, 
it, it's attached to the fence, which is line lining the lake. So I always looked at it like, um, because the banks are so hard, it was like tapping the side of a bathtub, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're all heavy handed. So I wanted to eliminate that side of things. That's something I'd certainly do if I was on my own and I wanted to be extra stealthy when I was walking on the lake. Um, again, you know, your bank sticks, uh, it was a bit of a nightmare with the bank sticks. So, you know, again, gleaning information from what I'd read before, uh, you know, making sure that you, you're setting up as far back as you can. Sounds all like simple stuff, you know, but being really careful about how uh, I was treading and, you know, putting the bank sticks in and uh, and putting my kit down. I remember once or twice, um, <laughs> I remember one once I was fishing in Big Boys Bay right at the top and that's not innuendo. Um, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a corner uh, that, that has the, the lawn and the chicken swims um, and a big set of pads. And um, I was literally mid-summer and uh, I had an almighty explosion. And then I realized that it'd been my, it was my uh, wheelbarrow tire. And not long after that, although it was a slog, I ended up moving out of that bay just because I just thought, well, pff, it's, bomb's just gone off I just, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've just exploded. You know, this, again, we've got to stop this. Uh, anyway, so basically it was too much disturbance for my liking, moved out and then, yeah, started from another another spot. Um, but yeah, so um, going on to this third set of snags that, that, that had been taken out, um, I, if, you, well, if you've got time, I'll tell you a little story. Of course, we've got all, all afternoon. Um, basically, uh, so this, this sort of goes... Uh, to the, the the lengths um that were taken at times basically uh it was my mum's 60th birthday we'd all gone on holiday for a quick uh a trip to uh to wales ended up on the last night eating at this restaurant i had pigeon absolutely disgusting <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell i mean a lot you know anyway some some of those top carp anglers like them but i think they're disgusting and um but anyway um uh, yeah, so anyway, I've, I thought it was a little bit off and I felt it that over the next 24 hours. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately not, obviously Wales is about four hours from Sutton and it just happened to be the draw for uh, the start of the sec my second season um, on this lake. And uh, I obviously, you know, I had to be there for two o'clock, you know, they're, they're not going to wait for me. You know, uh, I think there was, uh, in the later years I fished it, um, I think there was five to four or five anglers that didn't get a swim on the first two days. And then they ended up doing draws for the first, second and third days, just because, not because the lake was small, had hardly any uh, swims. I think it had about 23 swims on it, but just purely because too many anglers had turned up for that draw. It was always historically a very, very productive first two or three days. And then Sutton normally would go quiet over July and it would pick back up again in August. And that's normally the time I normally sort of hit it a little bit harder. Um, again, a really unique buzz to that place. Um, being days only is very, in terms of all the sights and sounds are, you know, the, the, and the, the atmosphere is similar to the car park late when you, you know, you've got your rods in and you, you either went to bed after you've got the rods in in the morning or rods out at night. Um, you know, you go to bed with that extra special kind of, anticipation um because of what was in there you know were you going to bed just to be quiet effectively well as i say so um it was more yeah so what it was is because i i don't live locally generally the first you know, obviously you turn up the first light four o'clock in the morning that's when the gate opens but i was sleeping in the car when i was doing more than one day so generally it was to, just to catch up on sleep because mm, if you're fishing mm. at till half 10 i used to go and drive up the road park in you know in a local car park and then how lovely yeah i mean yeah you know if it was pissing down in rain you'd have to keep in the car which is yeah. even worse so what you do is you pack up you drive out the gates you go and park up you set the brolly up put the, the bed chair out we're only talking about three and a half hours sleep and then you'd be back on the lake for four o'clock in the morning if you were trying to string a few days together uh obviously doing this more than one one two days in a row you know you you're fucked by the end of it so Anyway, so I was fishing, um, I, was, I was trying to get to this, I was absolutely sick as a dog from this pigeon, both ends, and it was awful. Uh, I got a couple of hours sleep, uh, I know, small violins, etc. 
I'm um, never ordering pigeon. No, <laughs> no you I know I'm not it. painting a great picture. <laughs> it did taste a little bit strange, I'd, I'd, I'd admit, and it looked a little bit rare as well, but we won't go into that because we're probably going to have lunch in a little while. Uh, anyway, so cut a long, I try and cut a long story short. Uh, I ended up getting get to the lake on time. I lived for that day and the next 24 hours on a can of Rockstar and a protein shake because I couldn't stomach anything else. Obviously had to stop a few a few times on the road as well. Uh, obviously not the ideal scenario uh, trying to try to sort yourself out behind a bridge with a car parked up. Luckily the police weren't involved in that. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so I got to the draw. Luckily enough, uh, once I, uh, uh, you know, got the draw done, uh, I got the swim I, I really wanted it to fish, which is a swim called the Reedy. Um, a very, very underfished swim, uh, but an absolutely exceptional passing through point um, for the carp, especially on a southeasterly wind or a new southeasterly wind to go into Big Boys Bay. The great thing about the little Reedy, as, as I say, it was not fished at all hardly, is I had a lovely snag opposite. And um, this this willow tree was supported by scaffold poles, and just just and although um, the point swim uh, fished literally right next to this tree, you couldn't put a rod round the you couldn't really get a rod round the front of this snag, so it was best fish from the reedy. Anyway, so I got a rod over to this uh, little reedy swim, and one of the methods I used to use on Sutton. Um, was resting the swim and, and, and a little and often trickling in boilies, you know, hot shops and whatnot onto some of the either opposite marginal areas or the marginal areas. And um, but when and when I'd found that the fish had got onto it, and I'm talking, we're only talking six hours sometimes of rest, but because everything was, as I said before, so intensified because you only had a short window to fish, you had to reel in and then you start again at four it almost felt like that six hours was quite precious, you know, it was quite worth worth doing um, during a, a period of the day that wasn't that active anyway. Anyway, so I started uh, trickling in some bait and then this guy had moved, he was he was already in the point. I'd already gone round to speak to him and uh, again, like, you know, social being that I am, just sort of, you know, made my acquaintance known and spoke to him and he seemed all right. And I said, look, uh, you're not if if you're not fishing to the left of because he with the point it was split in two and he he was fishing both his rods out to the right. That quickly changed when I caught when I caught my first carp from this spot. But uh, we'll go on to that in a second. He said I was I'm only fishing to the right. That's fine. So anyway, I literally went in there, flicked some baits over the top of the tree because with a catapult wasn't as accurate. Went back round, you know, was watching, watching, got all my rigs ready. And literally, this wind was pumping in there. There was I could see fish coming in, cruising on the surface, and obviously this this was a, a perfect interception point. Um, yeah, from then uh, I'd have to go around again, and the guy was fast asleep, obviously catching up from the early start. I felt a little bit guilty at the time, but he'd already said yes, it was fine to bait up. So I put a few more baits in, quickly ran back round, and I'd already clipped up from previously in the day. Flicked the rod out. I think it was once, one or two casts, and I got it absolutely spot on. I'm really happy. It was a very small gap in this uh, in the snag, and uh, you know, you and that was one of the things on Sutton. It was because you had a short window, trying to do everything within a certain amount of casts. In my head, you know, I just, I just, it had to be. You know, I remember moving out of the pad swim once because I cast out about seven or eight times, six, seven or eight times. And I thought I'd bombed it and I'd seen one spook and I thought, oh, I fucked it up. So I'd, I'd moved out. However, this time I got it not nice, you know, within a couple of casts. Um, and yeah, fortunately enough, I ended up catching a 26 pounder. Nice sort of broken linear. That fought absolutely like ridiculously. Anyway, landed that, got it in, put it back. Uh, again, repeat the process. By now, mate, he swung a rod round just out sort of off the off the side of the island, went round again, same old process, say to him, oh, you all right, mate, how you doing, blah, blah, any joy? No, nothing, yeah, I'll see you had one. Yeah, yeah, well, luckily enough, yeah. Anyway, don't repeat the same process again, and fortunately enough, um, the next bite I had was before, just before dark, and it was the big common. Um, no, sadly, no. Not, not with us anymore, mm -hmm. 36 pound 10, I think it was at the time, but yeah, absolutely over the moon. I think it was 
yeah, I'd, I'd already caught three of the 18 the previous season. And again, one of them was out of that reedy swim. Uh, I could actually caught the brown out of the reedy swim, which what is a carp. Yeah, I mean, that that one was a, a total enigma, even. It just amazes me. Um, and that, that big common, you know, beautiful, beautiful car, obviously. Um, you know, one of the best ones in the lake, but at the same time, we're there really for the mirrors. And, that, you know, that that, um, that brown was, was quite a, it had its own unique kind of little story behind it as well, because um, I, I was lucky enough uh, to catch it. Uh, I don't think it had been out for three years um, before I'd caught it. Um, and yeah, I, at the time, um, I remember I was playing around with like little tippers and stuff like that. And uh, what what a fleck of white seemed to be, you know, what, what caught was catching their eye, you know, I think, um, you know, a few uh, a few people have been catching a white over over kind of light coloured baits. And anyway, uh, again, trying to cut a long story short, used a washing line to an area that I'd seen uh, some of the better fish cruising about really close in. And it was just interesting because um, they they definitely were gravitating to that early spring sunshine, you know, and it was almost like as the sun on the dial was going round, the, the carp would move, you know, they would be... They'd start off um, up by the reedy, sort of 11 or 12 o'clock. And as the sun moved round, you know, you get you get periods in the day where the sun was hitting a certain part of these two banks, namely the the, the river and the sunny bank and then the twins bank. And then they, they, they end up, if I'd been really, really smart about it, I would have fish started fishing in the reedy in the morning. I'd, I'd have, you know, and, and then I'd fish maybe further around in the day and done a few hours and then further even still around the twins bank on the last part of in in the evening however being a busy lake you couldn't always fish several swims in a day so um that wasn't really an option but so anyway yeah luckily enough uh there was a there was a swim to the left of the reed as well which also added to the appeal of it because it was closed and it'd been closed for quite some time uh called the pier swim and a real big drop down to it uh, big sleeper at the top of it, you know, and real blatant if you were fishing, you know, if you were fishing from there. But uh, obviously, that, I don't know why they'd taken it um, out. Maybe it was just there was too many swims down that bank. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I, I, I remember putting this putting this rig in, and uh, in terms of the baiting, I was I think I was putting in a a tiny little pinch of hemp. Um, you know, with each spoon rather than just the whole lot and just trying to spread it just because I wanted to kind of create almost like a little natural, more of a natural kind of um, old bait, just scattered around scenario sort of thing. And uh, I remember when I was putting the first um, spoon out, and, and again, it was a south easterly wind just trickling into this bay. I remember the undertow pushing the hemp uh, the opposite direction, where the, un the undertow somehow was carrying the lighter so I, with that, you know, I was really, had to be really, really careful of exactly where, you know, I was like the rig's there and I'm sort of baiting just to the right. By the time it's drifted down to the, almost like feeding a river. It was quite weird. I've, I've, I've seen it on a, one other lake as well. And I guess it's all about how the wind affects the, the lake's body and the undertow and how it, you know, move. You wouldn't know from the surface, you know, you would, you'd look at the surface and you think, oh, it's just going to take it that way with the rest of the floating objects. But obviously this was sinking. So what goes on below the surface, it was totally different to the surface. So with that said, obviously I baited accordingly just to make sure everything's behind the hook bait and also make sure that, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's actually around the hook bait rather than a foot and a half or two foot to the left. So yeah, that was, you know, that and that fish uh, ended up catching right in the middle of the day, sort of, I think it was 1.30 in the afternoon, you know, to totally random bite. Um, but yeah, that shows the sort of lengths that, that you had to go to and and uh, the, <laughs> the precise levels of approach that, that had to, I felt, had to be uh, achieved. And and uh, it did come out a few more times. I think it did nine, nine captures in total, that fish. The brown, uh, ever? Yeah, ever, yeah. Wow. And... You know, considering, you know, uh, you got, you know, it was, there was top, top anglers on there um, for, for a long, long time. It's been a well-written about and well-known mm. circuit water for a long time. It's quite some feat, really, for just a for just a finned animal, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, was he one of the more, was that 
right at the top of, of the, the elusive uh, scale, if you like. Yeah, I, I don't think there was anything more elusive than the brown that ever lived in that lake. Why do you think you were able to trip it up then? <sighs> Bit of luck. Well, I think there's a lot of luck involved mm -hmm. in fishing, isn't there? And I think, you know, um, yeah, definitely. And I, I think probably, who knows, maybe there is... Um, Maybe there is a uh, fate involved in, in it as well. Mm. I don't mm. know. What were you doing setup wise then? You know, because obviously that would be a really interesting case study in what is possible with the right setup. You know, the fact you've caught this, yeah. this carp that barely ever came out. Yeah, funnily enough, uh, when I look back at the pictures of that fish, um, it had a really small oval shaped mouth as well. Um, <laughs> whether that's, you know, um, that had something to do with it's uh, the dexterity it had in mm -hmm. terms of dealing with rigs and whatever it ate maybe that that's so um, but in terms of rigs and stuff like that um i think i was using a i think i was using an inline setup again it was running so it was like a shock of rig you know kind of like mm. um you know uh w what's been used on and off for a long long time but it was hard gravel i was fishing on wasn't any weed didn't have to drop the lead so yeah and then again every fish i caught i said touched on this earlier Every fish I ever caught out of something was on a long shank hook, which again, uh, if you extend the hook, or extend the shank of a hook um, in a way, it, or if you can do it and it's presented or the hook bait's presented very well, extending the shank is only going to improve the hook holding and um, anti-eject properties of, of the rig. Yeah, I mean, it always seemed to me, um, despite not being the most technical minded angler, that the long shank flipped and turned unlike, you know, so much better than any other hook. Yeah, exceptionally um, well. And if, yeah, obviously balancing that with a bait, with a barrel-shaped bait. Another reason as well, um, so Sutton's very, very coloured. Um, so uh, in terms of what you can see from the surface, again, going back to the surface, what you see on the surface and underwater is different. Mm. On Sutton, uh, and I didn't know this until later in my campaign on there, is that um, uh, one of the guys, he put an underwater camera down there. And uh, he was astonished, as well as I was when I heard about it, that the surface to the first couple of foot, which is what obviously what we can see, was uh, far more coloured than right. what was going on at the bottom. Yeah. So the the debris was floating as such, or in the upper layers, and obviously, obviously that puts a lot in the fish's favour in terms of you know how they can deal with sea and deal with the rigs, um, and you you obviously have to you know not take anything for granted on that front as well, you know. Um, although it was coloured and a lot of people, you know, well, it's coloured, you can get away with anything in there in terms of rigs. That's, you know, I'd always think that, you know, don't take the chance of that. Don't don't, um, don't take it for granted because they're a lot mm. more, uh, not clever, but they, I think they're certainly a lot, um, uh, they've got a lot more, uh, <laughs> what's the um, word for it? Mm. Yeah, a lot more awareness. Yeah, yeah. awareness. Yeah. There we go. So oh, here we go. Look, I've done some, done some googling. Oh, I could wow. see you digging away <laughs> in the background, Toby. <laughs> trying to do it discreetly. Yeah. So, so even there's the brown at, fish, right? Yeah, yeah, look even, at that. I mean, that is a very unique looking carp, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Lovely fish. Um, that row of scales is completely. I don't think you could find another carp like that, would you? Yeah. A little dip in the back. And um, again, if you look at the mouth, and that's fully extended. You know, it's yeah. sort of fully extending its mouth. Very small little oval mouth and I'm, I'm convinced that that was that's obviously something to do with um the reason why i didn't get caught so great fish though you know um, what what kept you at sutton then for that for, for 12 years or whatever that was uh well <laughs> it was a big fully really um i think uh although the brown um was the enigma of the pond as such um and not really anyone on anyone's list in terms of a target because it just wasn't it, you know didn't really come out much uh, the big fully was, you know, when I first saw it, uh, probably, um, you know, well, well, uh, long ago bef uh, before I even ever got a ticket. Um, I just thought it was most per perfectly proportioned, heavily scaled mirror I'd ever seen. I mean, you know? I feel like I've seen pictures of Jacko with it in the probably the 90s, early yep. 90s, I'd have said. Yeah. And it's a really old one. Like you say, it's been, it's been going for a very, very long time. Funnily enough, even though it had been caught about three or four times in the season where I, when i caught it because they opened the closed season 
uh, up for fishing. Well, you could argue that I caught it uh, unfairly and mm. not in the season. Um, to me, after 13, 12, 13 years, it, it was, that was okay, really, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'd done my time on there already. But um, yeah, absolutely incredible carp um, and yeah, still no, looks is. insane um, today. So yeah. That's it there. I mean, it's got a face, its face is very distinctive. It <laughs> looks wise. Yeah. As a, you know, it, as carp, it looks like a waterlogged piece of wood, doesn't it? It's ancient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, it, to be fair, like, again, it, the, pro the proportions for me are like, you know, it, it's, it's pretty perfect, really. Male fish as well. Um, and Big fin, look at the size of that peck. Yeah, yeah, massive, massive uh, fins on him. And Do you uh, think the disturbance they can cause with those fins is important to uh, the way your rigs work, Alex? A hundred percent, yeah, I do, yeah. Funny enough, actually, um, as I said before, um, you know, a lot of edge, it was edge fishing, some of it. Um, in fact, that compared to other lakes where I've fished with chops and bits in the edge uh that 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 lake out of most of them um more than any, any other actually because say compared to the match lake for example when i fished in the edge on the match lake fish really short rigs you know like either an inline or a big lead uh but very you know for like a five inch rig and i remember on my tackle my old tackle box i'd written on it um I, i'd put uh yately yately or well, put a y on it where, where I had a mark on my tackle box or I caught most of my Yately fish on in terms of not heather and stuff, but, you know, match lake fish um, and even some mill lane fish later down the line. Um, and then I also had a, an S um, on, on a mark on my tackle box um, because uh, more than any others, what I was going on to say is that I used a lot longer rig than I normally would do, which kind of edge fishing and stuff. And I perhaps... Perhaps it is down to the size of their fins or how they move, or maybe it's down to the fact that the bottom uh, was either silty or broken or large gravel. So it kind of leaned towards uh, a longer rig for better presentation mm. over that kind of mm. rougher ground, you know? Uh, God, I could never get my head around fishing chunky gravel. It just, it just the idea of that freaks yeah, me out. It's funny because um, when I caught that fish, the, the day before, or in fact, I remember when I when I lowered the rig in, um, and uh, yeah, I was basically literally just I made 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 it the string. I caught most of my fish out of something on stringers, you know, like a small package of boilies, just or you know, two baits or whatever. And I'd lower it in, and when I lowered it in, I'd I'd always prefer a good just solid, just a one thump rather than a thump and a roll, because a lot of these banks were sloping as well, or a lot of the gravel. Uh, ledges were sloping so uh, you know if you're lowering in and I felt it clunk clunk I'd be like that's not the one you know you, you don't want your you don't again I was fishing a lead clip you don't want the lead rolling over the or you know you don't want the lead or the rig rolling because no. God knows what's going to happen to it down there you just want it to sit and then that's so it so would you Try and whip the stringer out before it melted. Hundred yeah, percent, yeah, yeah. Because you only want a certain amount down there, right? exactly. You yeah. and, then, and you don't, you know, if you put it back down there again, you don't know exactly where that old that last string is, mm. was compared to where you're going to put it. I mean, talking inches here, but yeah, I'd rather whip it out and then redo it, start again, than than that. And those sorts of little little things, I suppose, you're not going to you know blow the world apart, but it would just improve the consistency of catching, perhaps, mm. you know? You're not an angler that, that likes to donk and then move the lead and donk again? No, not, not really. Just just because, again, I, I don't... I'd rather do that before I've done it, or before I've put a, a, a rig on so it. So you know exactly what the, the bottom's yeah, like? Yeah, at the end of the day, if I've gone donk, donk, who knows what's happened to that hook point between there and there? Yep. I don't know whether I think the hook point or I whatever. think a lot of lads use sticks and stuff, don't they? Yeah. If they're going to do that. Yeah, I, I, where is that as well? So if you're doing it with a stick, I suppose there's, you know, you might even drag it. I mean, funnily enough, um, when I caught Arthur out of the bars on the car park, I remember when I cast it out, <laughs> and I've rarely done it since actually, I just literally, almost like I would, you would do with a, with a leading rod, I just gave it a little tweak. And I remember just the lead just sliding like literally like must have been six inches or so, but it felt like glass and I left it, you know, and then I caught Arthur. Now, but, 
Go on. Did that straighten the hook link? Well. And was that a part of the, what it, happened? It probably, probably, well, they're more than likely would have straightened the hook link. I was fishing with a parachute stringer. Um, so the chances are I wouldn't have dinked the hook point, but because it was covered with PVA, etc. But I, I think most of the anglers um, that would, or that would or listen to this sort of uh, podcast or be as into their fishing, uh, you know, would, wouldn't, would prefer just to get a drop and leave rather than a drag back. But it's just so many things that can go absolutely, wrong. Absolutely. But I think the thing that occurs to me when you say that is that if you have a drop and leave, depending on your rig materials, there's quite often going to be a slight curve in that yeah, rig, Yeah, definitely. It? Yeah, and I, some anglers advocate that's better and others don't. I mean, in an ideal world, um, what would you prefer? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what you might visualise your rig to look like because it, sounds, it seems like you're the sort of guy who wants it a certain way. So like, yeah, when so you think about your rig, is it laid I'll be straight or is it? Yeah, I, if, I could, I'd, if I could cast out every time, it would be a straight hook link. Mm. Yeah, I just I just prefer it to be as far away from the lead as possible. That's even if the preference. fish is approaching hook hook sort of um, yeah. hook bait end. Yeah, I think um, I think they're often moving as they do it anyway. I mean, it's even with the underwater footage, it's very rare that they they approach a hook bait, stop dead. Yeah, <laughs> suck at it and it doesn't suck go it in. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they do, you know they like freeze. You know, it's like mannequin challenge all of a sudden and suck a hook bait in don't think it quite happens like that it's often on the move and i i guess with a lot of the rigs i've used in the past like the longer um the longer rig for fishing sutton um is that i'd imagine that the rig's tightening up at some point after they've um sucked sucked the bait in whether it's on the move or when it whether they've backed off of it or um yeah yeah i mean how a, a fish generally doesn't i haven't seen them often have so much dexterity that they can literally just stop and then like they only really stop when the tank's wrong mm -hmm. and then normally it's too too late anyway isn't it mm -hmm. um in terms of the you have done some fishing away from the kind of the pressured waters do you always take your a game wherever you go in terms of you go to the nth degree every time um no i'll be honest with you i'll be lying if i said yeah i'm, I'm on it all the time uh, I certainly mess up all the time, and um, but if I'm, you know, if if I think that, it, yeah, gem most of the time, if I'm, if I uh, say like we've got all old rigs and we kept old rigs, etc., I'll always tie up a new rig, or always make sure that everything's spot on, just just to just so there's no margin for error. Because nine times out of ten, if there's an error, those carp will find it. Mm -hmm. You know, no, that's a, that's a fair point, mate, and um, I think. I mean, I'm thinking, I guess I guess in my head, I'm thinking maybe those canal fish that you caught. Was, is there ever any time that you're more robust with your approach, you know, that you're less um, subtle? Yeah, I think when you've got higher stocks and uh, you're getting more bites and, um, yeah. Uh, because you will put out a hinge as well. I've seen you do that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I definitely, you know, when the, when the situation calls, uh, as I said before, I'm thinking about going on to the choddies um, at some point. Um with you know some of the swims on on Dinson just because it's not getting used you know it's not really um, there's definitely opportunities to be had um, where everyone's still spot fishing um, and then you know what's more well it is very very subtle in its own way but it's quite obtuse in mm -hmm. its own way at mm -hmm. the Chodricks mm -hmm. uh, scenario isn't it um, what I mean by that is it's quite you know uh, it's 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 not um, the word but, for it yeah it's not subtle by its, it's nature it's kind of in their faces yeah anymore, isn't it? um yeah yeah blatant almost a bit blatant yeah. um um yeah there's a word i can't think of but it's, well, you know we've got we've got it. there though i think i think we get i, I certainly get the idea mate <laughs> yeah. you know and it doesn't seem very you that either the whole chod thing i don't know why i can't um yeah no i mean i absolutely love chod fishing mm. um because it's it almost seems easy when it's going off it just seems easy you know once you set that stop up the right length once you're fishing in, if you're fishing in light weed and you're working out the drop that you need to be getting in that weed for the length of your stock. How do you do it? How do how I do, you know, do it? How do you know? Well, yeah. how do you know? Well, this is the thing. You get bites, don't you? Okay. So, and then you use, so, or so you use a bit again, of foam and it yeah. will come up. Right. Because once again, you're, like you said earlier, you're 
what happens in Alex West's world is you're on. You're always analysing across a session and across yeah. a few sessions how things are going and yeah. how you need to change to to sort of improve what you're doing. Definitely, you you just you fish and if you're catching, then you then you'll you'll stick with what you're doing. And if you're not, then you won't. Uh, when I first when I first went on there, my first carp on Dinton was on the chod rig. You know, I caught triple within a short space of time of me turning up on a chod rig. Not necessarily. Um, because it, I'd got everything, you know, the stop right and everything. It was just, it. well, I was just fishing for, I was just fishing on the fish. I saw fish show, um, didn't even, you know, a lot of the anglers, um, you know, again, it's sort of, your, um, it's set in their ways perhaps thought, you know, there's no biggins up here, there's not many biggins up here or they don't really get caught up here much. But, you know, lo and behold, that one was up there. And uh, even though I was fishing for smaller carp, because that was all I was seeing show, um, it was a bigger one that picked it up, and I always thought that when the, the small ones are showing, they're they're giving it away for the big ones, you know. Mm, so, mm. Uh, but yeah, like I absolutely, you know, um, when I get into the the chod fishing, it's actually quite an eat. Sorry if I'm fidgeting, it's this chair. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Don't worry, mate. We we we're, we're not far from the end. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not at all. They're um, not comfy, them chairs. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, one, it can actually be really easy chod fishing because. It's so hard for them to deal with, isn't it? It's such a short, stiff material. You know, once it's in there, if it takes a purchase, it's got to be so different to anything else in terms of like, you know, that the, the resistance coming from two ways rather than one yep. way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, here's a challenge for you, Tobes. Find a picture of Alex with Triple Row, not Son of Triple Row, which you've already shown. But that's a, that was at the big end. It was at the biggest fish yeah, in the lake so, at the time. Well, yeah. it was. Um, it was up until a few years back, and now it's Darren's linear, uh, which also I'm fortunate enough to, got, uh, to have caught. But oh yeah, what a fish that is now! It's huge, like chunk of a carp, triple row. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a love, lovely fish. Uh, we've got going on to say about Darren's is it's it's gone from when I caught it again on a choddy, uh, boily fishing over a spread, um, and going from that to fifty odd pound within a season is. It's just incredible a testament mm. to the to the water that that Simon's uh, done ever so well in. Um, we yeah, that was the second time I didn't catch that on. That wasn't on the chod. But so there's was, his dad. We've seen the son. There's his dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a, that's triple row. But yeah, that's so that um, that was uh, that was on a on a Ronnie. Was it on a Ronnie rig? No, it was on a um, a multi rig actually. Funnily enough. Um, mm. But yeah, I've 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 tried all sorts of stuff on there. Um, multi rigs definitely work on that place. talk to me about multis because i love a multi-rig mate this is my yeah me, though, um so. so i've used i mean i certainly not uh um, yeah i'm a bit of a jack of all, all on on the rig side side of things sometimes i do chop and change a little bit uh, a bit like a match fisherman would until you get bites i i've got two ways of doing it i have a fish uh a stiff material i've, I've got a uh a, 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 like a i guess a subtle um small fish small bait uh, winter variation which i i use um like a a, a, a more subtle material mm -hmm. um and to match the size of the hook yeah and also um a shorter um kind of more kind of robust sort of variation to, for bigger carp like triple um with with larger hook baits but generally um i i try and use the smallest loop as i can is that um, the, is that, that looks like the same is that the so same that was the, that was a different that, that was, was the previous catch, this was yeah. the first but this was, was a year earlier right got you, the yeah. article yeah so that was that was on the chod rig um so with the with the multi cheers Tobe. good good work but right. with the multi um you don't i've often felt when i've used it like i'm doing a poor man's stiff inch you know i like what a lot of what it does i love i love how low you can fish it yeah i love that i don't need to retie the rig if i if it, the hook gets done but quite a lot of its attributes are, are, are just not quite as good as the hinge you yeah. know which i know you do like as well so yeah um, how do you square that off well again it's 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 bites isn't it it's doing it's doing your time i suppose it's, do you fish them quite low alex the oh sorry the yeah. hinge yeah um so even, sorry, no, the, the, the multi is a multi used so multi odd if personally a, a, a multi odd literally just try and get the loop over the hook right yeah 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 um but it all depends, doesn't it? It's horses for courses. At the end of the day, if you're fishing in heavy chod and you're single hook bait fishing, um, I think with a single, you're more than likely to get away with a longer, uh, you know, a, a higher pop up. Like. 
because uh, they've got no, no reference point. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you're fishing in weed, you want to. You've got. I personally would fish something that I think presented the best on the ground that I'm fishing over. Yes, which is um, solid advice, I think, for anybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if I'm fishing over bait, so a few years back on Dinton, it all seemed to be very much. Um, you know, pop-ups over bait, whether it's boilies or particles, that was that was the way to go, you know. And I caught a few fish on it myself, but I just couldn't, didn't seem to be, I didn't get my head around it fully because um, I didn't do ever so, ever so well on it. Um, I obviously caught triple on it, but I only had a, a handful of bites uh, on it. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, generally for me, I'd prefer if I was fishing over lots of bait, then mm. it would be a bottom bait or a wafter and... Mm. Uh, and, and try and match it to, to to the to the bottom. Yeah, I mean, I think because we are coming towards the the end of things, Alex. I intended to start by talking to you a little bit about what you've been up to most recently. Yeah, but let's finish with that, which is um, you went again off the beaten track a little bit by comparison to the circuit waters that yeah. we have talked about in the Con Valley, didn't you? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how your kind of summer really did finish off with quite a bang, didn't it? There? Yeah, so that this was actually the start, well, so the start of the summer, it was, um, I, I started fishing a lake, which is, uh, you know, anyone can go and have a go. Um, uh, it's um, it's not massive. Um, I'm not gonna obviously go into massive, massive no, detail no, because yep. still got a few pals that, uh, you know, obviously, I don't want to blow out of the water. You know, it's, it's well known about, but uh, absolutely incredible carp in there. Um, there's a few fish in there that, that are really lovely. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically started on this lake, did a few recce kind of walkabouts first. I always built it up in my head because there was only one target fish. And it's been a while since I fished a lake for just one target mm, mm. Um, rather than multiple targets. Um, so in terms of approach, it was more you know, working out and getting in the head of that one fish rather than it kind of makes it a little bit easier uh, to, in some respects. But so I started on there in the summer um, or it, actually a little bit earlier than that um, in terms of my walkabouts, getting, getting a feel for the place, um, getting an idea of, again, the cart bank and mm. seeing where most people were putting their time and effort. Um, and you could it is a kind of like any anything goes on there as well like you know i had a little dinghy over there or by the end of it i was i was getting around all over the shop on there you know i was baiting three different spots and fortunately enough um i had carp feeding on three of these different spots um i was using a mix uh in my or mixture of bait that i was confident in and and uh, i'd seen them absolutely ripping the bits um in a marginal area that i'd i kind of opened up um ended up catching a few smaller ones from there i had a, a fish um at a 17 pound mirror was my first carp from there um that absolutely it run me ragged <laughs> and it, it's it's always the way isn't it the doubles fight 10 times harder than the big ones it's it's how they get the energy is it well they obviously young I, I suppose but and i think this one's from the year that from the river as well so um it's it's obviously been swimming for its life forever uh, up until this point to its escapee in this lake. Anyway, so I knew my bait was working because they, you know, pretty much eating it on the drop. I uh, had another area at one end of the lake which I was um, I was baiting from like the bank, but I was I actually found um, in the dinghy. Um, it was a lovely sandy ledge, and uh, I didn't actually catch one off of it, but the bait the quantity of bait I was putting on it and loading as such, each time I baited it up, it was, and it was gone the next morning. It wasn't swans because it was out of swans depth. Uh, it could only have been carp. You know, it's not, there wasn't a hell of a lot of like nuisance fish in there that I encountered anyway. Um, but uh, the turning point was about my sixth or seventh night. And I'd done a few random nights here and there uh, previous to this. Um, and I pitched in this uh, in the swim. Uh, well, actually, one of my first nights, I think. Uh, but this actually, actually, like, was a culmination of of catching this fish. As the one sighting um, from this first trip or second trip or whatever, I basically pitched myself in in the middle of the of the lake, um, within walking distance of this uh, area, which I could view both ends from. And it was a. Uh, I, I think I got up at first light. And uh, I was literally like 
pace in between these two little viewing spots on this kind of a point swim. And uh, I think I was, you know, I was, I was kind of consigning myself back to the sleeping bag at this point because I was pacing a little bit and, I, you know, been watching for about 45 minutes or so. And then, um, yeah, as I was looking up the main bulk of the lake, I've just seen a big head poke out, you know, out in front of this area. And that was it. I thought, right, that's where I need to be, you know. Um, so I sort of packed up, reeled in, shot up there. This was still, you know, around six o'clock in the morning and um, just flung the rods out, you know. Nothing really happened, obviously, because I didn't, you know, really know. In fact, I didn't even go in that swim. I'd fished it from a different angle. And it turned out that wasn't really the one. I ended up baiting on and, and markering from this other swim, which wasn't getting fished at all. And in previous seasons, um, it had been heavily fished. Um, in fact, that big one was known for getting caught from that zone as well. So it kind of had a bit of history and, you know, background behind it. Um, again, another really old lake, sort of quite quite an atmosphere on it the other night, you know, quite eerie as well. And, uh, you know, the, the the surrounding area is a little bit moody to say the least. Anyway, so I won't go into too much detail about exactly where it is because for ruining yeah. it for other anglers. But anyway, cut, cut a long story short, I baited this area and then I baited it again. I didn't fish it for a little while and then the wind sprung right for it. Ended up going in there. Um, and when I went back in there and had a lead, uh, the spot instantly felt a lot harder than when I originally put the bait in because of what I did was I'd cast out a marker. Um, I'd go out in the dinghy and then bait up only, only a little bit, not loads, not, you know, just enough to kind of clean it out, off a bit. Um, hemp and whatnot, a few chops. And uh, as I say, I, I was using, um, I think I was using sticky pellets and, uh, and bloodworm boilies as well and some particles and um yeah a body body but the third time uh, i went a bait um it was it was really really clean and i was fishing i did two nights the first morning they were sheeting up all over me and i was using pop-ups at this point uh, and i thought maybe the pop-ups aren't the one i did put a little bit too much particle in for that situation but i thought no i'm gonna stay for another night did another night um and I was actually due to go and fish Dinton because it was the start of the season because um, they've got a close season on there a month. So ended up uh, putting some bait in and um, only a little bit this time. I only put in, you know, like less particles. So just a few boilies, etc., on the with the dinghy for the next night. Um, and as I say, in the morning, it was again, it was, it was pretty lifeless, to be honest. And uh, being a free for all, I'd gone round to see uh this this guy called logan who uh i think he's, he's a bit on the carp scene as well he's uh he's quite a good angler caught a few out of something too anyway so i had a cup of tea with him i said well i think if nothing happens this morning i want to go and do this dint and draw and the wind was picking up it's getting even better and better the conditions as I, as the morning was going on and it was about 11 o'clock in the morning i'd only been around there for half an hour i sort of started walking back and uh after there's a you know as Anyway, halfway round, I've had an absolutely one note intake. You know, the Neville was just screaming and uh, got to the rod, sort of jumped into water, got got to the rod, struck into the rod, played it in, and uh, I had this 26 pound common, um, which I think you've got a picture of mm. somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I had it this is. common. Um, Strange old head on it. Yeah, so yeah, a bit of a funny old mouth yeah. on him. Yeah. Um, but apparently it's one of the old ones in there. Um, one of the better fish. There's not loads of big, big ones, but um, there's a few nice mirrors mm, and mm. there's a yeah, there's a couple of real big mirrors in there. But so anyway, so with that, um, I, it kind of, you know, I'd, I'd already packed up everything onto the barrel at this point and I was, I was about to go to Dinton. I had to take my, um, uh, I had to take my mum to hospital because um, she needed to have a checkup. So I had to go and drive and do that. I set everything back up and told, because Logan was going to be down there. I said to you, I said to him, can you stay? Well, not, can you stay? Said, can you keep an eye on my gear, please? Because um, I've just got to do this errand. Anyway, I went back, did another couple of nights. My very last night, did exactly the same. And uh, yeah, um, middle of the night, I had this twitchy take. Again, jumped in the water, um, bobbins right to the top, 
bit of a nondescript uh, fight. And uh, and yeah, I, I think the lead had properly dropped off this time, fortunately enough. And um, yeah, a few lunges under the rod tip, it sort of sunk down into the deeper water and playing it. And I, you know, I didn't even recognize, I was sleeping in the eyes or whatever, but I didn't even recognize it at first. And then um, obviously, properly looking in, rolling it over in the net, realized it was, uh, it was the kind of, uh, it was the, 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 the one I wanted to catch, you know, it was that big, big sort of scaly mirror. One um, of the sort of, one of the new sort of kings of the Con Valley, isn't it? It's one of the sort of ones that have emerged over the last 10 years, really, to be that next group of fish that people yeah. are interested in. Yeah, mega, mega old carp. Um, I think it is a female, that one, because it does fluctuate. And uh, yeah, absolutely over the moon. Yeah, with that it looks one. beautiful, just, mate. Just incredible. One, once I realised it was that one, again, it was that, you know, that sort of euphoric, uh, you just can't describe it with words, can you, really? It's... Um, yeah, smile says it says it all, I guess, in a way. It really does, mate. And look, thank you so much for coming in, mate. And best of luck for your endeavour this autumn. I'm Cheers, sure you'll be out much. there. Um, and uh, yeah, here's to uh, many more moments like that, mate. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd just like to say a, a massive thank you to uh, Thinking Anglers and uh, Sticky for, for their support. And also uh, Luke at Surbiton Angling as well. for uh, And also Raseby Baits for sorting me out particles because... Um, yeah, without without those guys' support, it'd be really, really difficult. It makes it a lot harder to, mm. to do it without a little bit of support. So thanks very much. And thanks to yourself, Rich and Corda, for giving me the opportunity. No drama, mate. Cheers, Alex. Cheers. The Thinking Tackle Podcast.